Good evening and welcome to the July 10th, 2019 Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeals. If you could all join and rise under the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> James Hebert? Here. Rudy Kieran? Here. Great. Thank you. And welcome to the July 10th, 2019 Scarborough Board and Zoning Board of Appeals. This meeting will now come to order. This is a public proceeding, and unless the board specifically votes to go into an executive session, the public has the right to hear everything that is being said and to view all the exhibits that are presented. Please notify the chairperson, me, if you are unable to hear or to see the proceedings. The board will work from a prepared agenda and will take up tonight's items in the following order. First, we will approve the minutes from the last couple meetings and approve the draft written decisions for two other decisions. And we have two, we have three appeals tonight then. We have appeal number 2661, which is a special exception appeal, and then appeal number 2662, a variance appeal, and then appeal number 2663, which is a practical difference difficulty variance appeal. In each instance, the burden is upon the applicant to demonstrate the compliance with each of the criteria or provisions of the applicable appeal. The board will ask questions as necessary to understand the nature of the appeal as fully as possible. When all testimony has been heard, the chairman will close the record and the board will adopt finding of facts for each chairman of the appeal and to vote to determine if the applicant has met the burden of proof necessary to meet the criteria. It is important to note that if any of the appeal or special exception criteria has not been met, the board must deny the appeal or the application. In many cases, the appellant or the landowner may have a personal problem which prompted the request or the variance. Please understand this is not legally relevant to the appeal, no matter how sympathetic the board may be to the applicant's situation. After the board votes on the merits of each criteria, a motion may be made to approve the appeal, and if there is a second, discussion will follow. The board will then state conclusions of law based on finding of facts to, to support a decision on the motion. A general vote will then take place on the appeal. If the majority of the voting members present, present vote on, in the affirmative, the appeal is approved. If the majority of the voting members vote in the negative, the appeal is denied. The board's decision stands as of the date of the vote was taken, regardless of the approval of the final written decision. Generally speaking, appeals from adverse decisions must be filed with the Superior Court except as otherwise provided by law within 45 days of this board's decision. Again, we remind everyone that this is a public proceeding and you have the right to hear and see what is happening. All persons speaking will be asked to first state their name and address or affiliation, and all board members and interested parties are asked to direct their questions through the chair. Thank you. So first we're going to approve the minutes from the May 8th, 2019 zoning board meeting. Did everyone in the board get a chance to review those minutes? Yes, we did. Any no. questions or concerns? No. Nope. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve the June 12th or May 8th. May, May 8th meeting <laughs> minutes as, as written. And seconded. All in favor? And are you abstaining? I'll abstain. And then we have the June 12, 2019 meeting minutes. Did everyone have any questions or concerns? Comments? Motion to approve? I'll move to approve as presented. Second. Second. All in favor? I'm abstaining. Those in here. Okay. Now we have the approval of the draft written decision for the appeal that was heard on May 8th, which is the appeal number 2659, which is Lake Ellis of 243 Pine Point Road. Did everyone get a chance to review the, that decision? Yes. Yes. Any questions or concerns or comments? Motion to approve. Motion to approve special exception permit ap approval uh, 2659 as written. Second. I'll second. All in favor? Sorry. And 
then we have the written decision from the appeal of June 12th, which is appeal number 2660 of Driftwood at Higgins, which was 8 Ocean Ave. Did everyone get a chance to review those? Yes. Yes. Any questions, concerns, or comments? Well, I'll move to appeal. I'll move to approve <coughs> the written decision on appeal number 2660 as presented. Second. I second. All in favor? Great, thank you. So we will move into the first appeal, which is appeal number 2661, which is a special exception appeal by Highland Ave Greenhouse, <coughs> located at 209 Highland Ave, assessor's map R79, lot five. I'm first gonna ask Mr. Longstaff to give us some background on this application. Sure, Ms. Chair. Um, Appeal 2661 is a special exception appeal. Uh, the applicant is seeking approval to erect another greenhouse um, on their uh, commercial agricultural um, use activity at that address. Um, this greenhouse is, as I understand it, is to be dedicated to hosting events uh, which are accessory to the commercial agricultural <coughs> use, um, which must be approved by special exception in the R2 district. Uh, the parcel is 9.1 acres. Um, the events included in the applicant's narrative are classes, workshops, fundraisers, and other functions. Um, this uh, additional accessory use is not subject to site plan review uh, per the exemption in Chapter 405B, Section 2B4. So the board, it's really, this is the only review that's going to happen for this proposal other than a building permit and the required inspection. Great, thank you. And can we ask the applicant or their representative to please come up? Hi. Hi, good Hi. evening. How are you? Good, please introduce uh, I'm Christine Visconti, and I live at 125 Highland Ave. Um, our company is 109 Highland Ave. And I'm Kate Lucasio King. Okay. Thank you. Would you like to give us some information about your application tonight? Um, sure. Well, where should I start? What would you like to know? I don't know if you want to tell us anything about what you're looking for tonight specifically, or it looks like you had a nice introduction letter here. Sure. Okay. Um, do you want me to read that so everyone, I don't know what they've seen or what they haven't seen, but I can kind of summarize what we If you just want to summarize it, okay. that's fine. Um, so, we are here um, to get approval for um, a new dedicated space to um, host our workshops and events in. Um, currently, we're hosting a bunch of different types of workshops and classes um, and fundraising events and whatnot, and we're using it, we're currently using a space that is used for something else, um, so we're emptying that space out and then putting it all back together every time we do this. Uh, one of our greenhouses existing, uh, which is the longest one um, on the, kind of more towards the left there, we took part of that down because it was too long for retail and we are relocating it out into the area marked proposed. Um, and that is where um, we want to have a dedicated space to hold the events that we're already doing um, and possibly increasing that as an offering to what we're doing. Okay, great. So what we'll do now is I'm gonna go through the, qual the special exception qualifications here. And I'll just, if you want, you can just read in the answers that you provided. Okay. Or elaborate as you please. Um, so the standard for special exceptions is, um, first we have A, the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful unhealthful conditions by re reasons of sewage, disposal, emissions to the air or water or other aspects of its design or operation. Sure, so um, per the instruction of James Butler on March 7th of this year, um, the farm consulted with a site evaluator as to determine the best way to handle wastewater for the proposed greenhouse with seasonal use of an event space. Accordingly, Albert Frick Associates conducted a site evaluation and determined, based on their experiences and dealings in these matters, that portable bathroom trailers would be the best option. 
Um, I have an email from Matthew Logan stating why he thought that was the best option, um, and it explains um, the overview and rationale behind his recommendation. Um, and there will be no change in air or water emissions. So tell me more about the portable bathroom trailers. Sure. Is that something that you have for the whole season and they service, or does it come and go? No, it comes and goes only as events are being held. So it would be there for a day. Say if we had a fundraiser, we would bring one in um, just to service the area a little bit better. Um, we currently use <coughs> bodies for our customers, um, which are located further away from this area. Um, so we decided Right. Yeah. I have a question, Madam Chair. Um, with regard to size, um, what's the anticipated occupancy? How many stalls, I guess, will be in this bathroom uh, trailer? Will it be sort of a single-use trailer, or will it be a gang bathroom with multiple stalls in it? it Both sexes, single sex? Or? It completely depends on the event that is happening. Um, if we have an event for 30 people, then we probably just get another porter body. Um, if we have an event for 100 people, um, we would just go by a recommended um, use for, like, um, Triano, for example, rents them out. And so whatever they would recommend for best use um, okay. would be what, what, what we would do. So it wouldn't necessarily be the same trailer over and over, because um, we, we just want to stick it with what we're working with. Gotcha. So it would be based on, <clears throat> it'd be based on size of the event Yes, that you're going to have there. Yes. Okay. And that cost of the trailer would probably be passed on to them through their fee of renting the space? Exactly. Or if it's like what we're doing now where we um, have a ticket price for our workshops, oh, it would just be worked into that cost of doing business. Okay. If you don't mind, just a follow-up question just to confirm. You've shared that there are existing porta parties elsewhere on site that are available for use? Yes. And this would just be for um, any additional occupancy that would be uh, required on site? Yes, okay. more uh, easier to access. Sure. Okay, I guess, so I was thinking it would sit there for like a week, and what you're saying yeah. is like it would be like we have an event, it comes and goes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think the best way to think of it is like a rental you'd have for any other event. Right. You might yeah. rent tables for an event. It's yep. the same idea, it's just much larger and more practical. Right. Yeah. I think for me, you, this is what you're doing in alternative to actually putting in a whole like septic system and stuff. So I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be a permanent sort of thing. Oh, what you're saying yeah. is that it's going to really just be specifically when the events are happening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm familiar with these, and they're they're usually kind of like a trailer that is pulled in. I've seen and, my concerts. Yeah, and you know, there's usually somewhere between four and six stalls or whatever, you know. Um, they're much more elegant than a porta potty, <laughs> and, and it would right. be much more appropriate for a certain event that you know. I, but I could see where you would you would flex that based on what the event was exactly. and what what was called for for the situation. Yeah. Absolutely, a large force behind this is consumer requests from yeah. people who attend the classes and workshops, and they want to host events here and they want them to be a little bit more elevated. Mm -hmm. Porta potties aren't very elevated. Not so much. <laughs> we do our best. Yeah. This is purple. <laughs> That's as good as it gets. All right, thank you. Sure. All right, so B, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to the existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Um, the existing parking lot, um, 80, which consists of 87 9 by 18 parking spots, is sufficient to continue to supply the needs of the existing use as well as anticipated needs of the proposed use um, of an event space with an intended use only between the months of June through October. And we don't anticipate any additional pedestrian traffic. I have a question about that. Sure. <clears throat> as I read through your proposal, it, um, you said that you were doing this to increase traffic or sales, generate more sales. Yes. Um, and in doing so, that means you're going to have more cars. Yes. Okay. And when do you propose to have these events? During the peak uh, season when you're also selling a lot of 
Actually, a lot of extra what? Sorry, continue. Well, when are, you, when are your busiest times of the year? Because I assume your business is somewhat seasonal. It's very seasonal. Mm -hmm. um, our busiest times of the year are actually April and May. Right. So when would you be hosting these kind of events? Uh, Mid-June through October. Okay, so later on you're saying? Yes. Past peak. Yes. All right. So, it's not, so what you're saying then is that you're trying to build sales during what's normally a slower time of the year? Exactly. Okay. And the, if I read into that then? You, you do have quite a bit of parking spots right there, mm -hmm. okay? And during, just to, to further you know, follow up on that uh, past peak, during those June through October months, what would be the typical amount of cars that you might see there at peak time? The maximum amount? Six. Six, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so your business is extremely seasonal. Very. All right, so yes. you're, just, you're just trying to expand your <laughs> You're season longer by off, by hosting these kind of events. Exactly. Okay. We, right. we do about half of our revenues in April and May. Right. That's what I figured. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it's not really going to affect ingress and egress or parking, right. any of those things, because it's during non-peak, strictly non-peak yes. times. Okay. Yeah. I would also dovetail that, that there's peak seasons and months, and there's also peak parts of the day. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Classes and workshops are typically held at like 4 p.m. Yeah, later on in the evening. Yeah. Right, or late after one or late afternoon yeah. um, okay. for immediately after work for classes. Um, so again, when all the staff is needed to help customers in the greenhouses, you know, peak between like 10 and 2 or whatever, the classes are being held at different times. So you currently have 87 spots right now? Yeah. And I mean, I guess I'm trying to see where exactly they are. Um, and are you adding any more parking? No. So the road where it says parking, 87, it's dirt, so they're not lined. Um, mm -hmm. I do line them during busy times, but it's with, uh, you know, it wears off, obviously. Right. <laughs> um, but they are on both sides of that section where you see cars now in that picture, but it actually continues down the side of those greenhouses as well to where the arrow ends. And then I also have 11 spaces up there which are kind of additional. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so with this new building, what sort of capacity, I mean, because you're saying 87 spots, but when you have, you know, vendors and porta potties and things like that and people coming and parking, is there any sort of overflow or would they end up in the street, do you think? Um, from experience, we haven't really ended up with uh, much for street parking. Our yeah. Uh, pumpkin Festival fundraiser is a very large event, um, and we have par people parked all over the field mm -hmm. and down the side of our road, which is accessible with 18 wheelers, so it's very wide. Right. Um, and then in front of our fence, which has a very big setback from the road. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually where parking used to be a long time ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So, yeah, we've got a lot of overflow space. Most of the field is also just coming out, so. And I've, I've actually never been there, so I apologize. Is it is it like a horseshoe loop? You come in, you come out, come in one way, and come out the other? Um, yeah, during busy times, uh, like during Pumpkin Festival, for example, we do have um, people come in uh, from where my north marker is. Mm -hmm. They come in, go through, they park, and then they can continue out and around the uh, right side of the greenhouses and out that way. Right. So okay. it does kind of. Make for easy use. Yeah, I'm quite familiar because it's pretty much right in my backyard almost. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys have always done a really great job of, of managing parking flow and, and space. Of, and that, even even in the middle of you know Christmas tree season when there's a lot of people and there's snow everywhere. Yes, yeah. Um, which is a very different time of year. But you know, um, so I, I can't see where you would have any problem. And I also can't imagine where you would not be smart enough to make sure that you were never stacking it up where you had an event going at a peak time for your sales because that would not be good <laughs> business practice. So yeah. I'm, yeah. And I'm only one person, and as is she, and it's tough enough yes. to get through that season. As it is. Exactly. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. I'm sure. Um, in the today, what's the largest event that you've had there that's potentially filled that to capacity? 
previously? The Pumpkin that. Festival. The Pumpkin yeah, Festival. Yeah, we've done that seven years, and every year it's grown. Um, mm -hmm. This last year was a tricky one because it actually rained on our date. So right. we ended up doing the original date and our rain date, but the year before it was gorgeous weather, and we um, figured we had about 900 people there. Nice. It was a, yeah, it was great. No, was that? We raised a lot of money. <laughs> no, sure, and that's wonderful. Um, with regard to parking, that you were still fine with 87 spots on that side and 11 spots on that side. There, was, yes. there wasn't any overflow on the street or anything like that? Well, like I said, in front of our fence, there's uh, like 20 feet from the fence to the, yeah, to the sure. actual pavement, there's mm -hmm. a, a, a big kind of shoulder. Um, so sometimes my customers, when there's 87 spots open, park there. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, if there was overflow, it kind of went in that direction. But during those types of events, which I don't anticipate having more than one because it's plenty of work, um, you know, we have two parking attendants. And that type of event also is a, a more of an open house style where people are kind of revolving. So not sure. all 900 people were there all at the same time. Um, so. Great. Okay. Yeah. So the, the existing parking spots that you're able to fill that with no problem and they cycled through without yeah. any traffic issues. Yeah, yeah, we've been really happy actually with how it's gone. Great. So, <clears throat> okay. Thanks. We like to keep people moving smoothly. It's, it's all part of the customer service. <laughs> right. They're not going to yeah. stop if you're if it's not easy. Right. To get it now. Yeah. Madam Chair, just yeah. a couple questions if you don't mind. Um, would you mind please clarifying a statement you shared earlier about the longest building on the site that it was being reduced and relocated to the proposed area? Yes. So. Um, the best way to like point to it. The, the longest greenhouse, which was kind of grayish white, yes, that yes, one, okay. um, is, was 160 feet long in a retail sense. It was far too long. People never made it to the end before they turned around. <laughs> and it got very hot um, because the air doesn't circle, cycle through as well. So um, we decided to take part of that down because it also opened up to the retail space to the left. Um, and so we just wanted to relocate that section that we took down and put it out in that field. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, it may be fair to say that there's not a great increase in the uh, confined space or area as you're reducing one to relocate it elsewhere. Okay. Exactly. Um, and the follow-up question about the busy times of day, uh, classes in the afternoon after work, um, how late uh, would it possibly uh, go in the, into the evening? Um, right now, our latest classes run until usually nine. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I have a general question, not related to, uh, not directly related to uh, parking issues. Do you anticipate ever doing food or beverage service on site? From a catering standpoint. Uh, well, whether it be yourselves doing it or bringing in food trucks or an outside caterer. You actually already do have food service on site, don't you? We do have we food do that service already. on site yeah. Yeah, already. Actually, that was the last time I was mm -hmm. up before mm -hmm. this morning. <laughs> okay. um, really good food service, right, so, too, by the way. <laughs> so, you, so what you're saying is, I just want to make sure I'm clear on this, yep. you're not doing it yourself. So you're bringing out you know, outside people to, yes. to do it. Okay, so there's no preparation done outside. No. Okay, thank no. you. Okay. C, the proposed use will not create public safety problems which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree of municipal fire or police protection than the existing uses in the neighborhood. Uh, let's see, the proposed use will not be substantially different from <coughs> existing use and does not anticipate a substantially greater degree of municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. The existing use currently has regular functions and gatherings of people and retail customers. The proposed use would only add additional people on limited dates during a set season of the year. Okay. So right now I understand that you're doing educational things. Um, do you hold events? And tell me, and then do you serve any sort of like alcohol at any of the events that you're currently having right now? Did you guys have like, like a wine tasting or painting thing or something? There is a wine tasting, yeah. yep, which is done through our distributor. We don't serve that. Um, but, um, yes, what was the other part of the question? 
So I'm, I'm wondering what the difference is in what type of new uses you're going to be using. Because um, you are in a residential neighborhood, so it's important to see what sort of changes from what you've been doing before and what changes you want to do now. Mm -hmm. So what the whole point of the special exception, Correct. Essentially. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, what we've been doing um, falls under the agritainment that we're already um, able to do given the agriculture section that we're, we fall under. Um, really what we're here for is because we've been approached by many customers who want to have their baby shower here or mm -hmm. have a reception here or have a, a corporate event. You know, a, it kind of runs the gamut of different um, ideas. Also, I mean, with the Try for a Cure is coming up, I've been approached by many uh, women who wanted to have their Try for a Cure fundraiser there. Mm -hmm. You know, some small related to classes that we're already doing, some, you know, like a, anything. I mean, anything you can do as a fundraiser. Um, so that is why we're here, because it kind of falls outside of our agritainment category. It kind of it falls into maybe larger groups of people, you know, somebody's baby shower doesn't really have anything to do with my horticulture business. Yeah. It's more of a, a social aspect. So, right. so if I may, uh, for just a follow-up question on that. <clears throat> if you're using an outside caterer or a food truck, to do those kinds of things, right? You know, some of them may be serving alcoholic beverages, but they're they're solely under control of that, not you. Yeah. Okay. Would you have any live uh, <coughs> music or entertainment? It falls under one of the other qualifications. We'll get we'll get to <coughs> uh, music and noise and all that in a little bit. <laughs> um, I don't know if we have any questions related to this one here. Any other board members? No. Okay. We're good to move on. Um, D, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supply. Uh, the proposed use will result only in a minor grade change uh, in the immediate vicinity of the structure, which will not result in increased erosion. The proposed use is anticipated to result in a minor decrease in erosion as the greenhouse will reduce the amount of land tilled for farming use. So the building's still intact and the plan is to cut it in half and move it? It doesn't really seem like you would be moving much of the earth to do that. Mm -mm. No, and actually there are poles in the ground. Yeah. So it's taking one pole out and putting one pole in. Yep. Um, so we're actually leveling just a, a little bit of the mm -hmm. land, yep. um, which obviously when it's more level, it's not running off. Um, but um, it'll also reduce the space that we would have otherwise be plowing and tilling for farming, which mm -hmm. unfortunately in its practices results in more erosion. <coughs> E, the proposed use will be compatible, compatible with the existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Uh, the proposed use will result in one additional and aesthetically similar greenhouse on the existing working farm with intended use as an event space only between the months of June and October. The proposed use will be located adjacent to the existing parking lot and across from existing greenhouses. I think Ben referenced that map. All right, so this gets to the question of, uh, I believe, of alcoholic beverages and live music. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we've ar you've already answered the question regarding alcoholic beverages. <clears throat> for live music, would that be a possibility for some of the events like showers, weddings, things like that? Uh, That's like under eyes. We well, have yeah, a band, there, for example. Yeah, let's say the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the family putting on the event. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to have live music. You like right, a band. Part of the event, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're going to bring a band in. They're going to hire a band, bring them in. Okay, would, would that be acoustic or amplified or both? I think whenever the space... Well, I'd, like, I'd like to actually yeah. hold this till we get to yeah, actually it's eye. It's okay. a qualification yeah, that, that well, talks about I'm not noise. That yet. So let's wait till we actually get to eye I to can. talk about that one. Oh, that's further down. I'm sorry. Yeah. I apologize. No, I have a question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> With regard to the sedimentation erosion, um, you'll have uh, utilities put out to the new building, electricity, yep. um, any plumbing, water, sewer, I, sewer probably not because you have the bathroom trailer, Right. Um, but we'll, like a sink for running water or something like that? or um, We will probably have a sink for running water just for, you know, hand washing use or kind of whatever okay. that you need running water for. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Any other questions? 
just one general question. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. um, general, you shared earlier that larger vehicles are able to traverse the site very, fairly easily, um, and it's a horseshoe shape. Uh, have in the past experience, uh, it's been a while, around a while, uh, any issues with fire trucks uh, accessing the site? Has there ever been a time that's happened? No. Okay. No. I mean, we've had fire trucks on site for pumpkin pencils, okay. but no issue with them getting around. Thank you. Okay. F, if located in the shoreland zone as depicted on the Town of Scarborough's official shoreland zoning map, the proposed use will comply with all the requirements of the Town of Scarborough shoreland zoning ordinance. Uh, the existing and proposed uses are not in the shoreland zone. G, the applicant has sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. Uh, the applicant is the owner of the property. And it looks like you provided our deed as well mm -hmm. here. Each, the applicant has the te technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. Yes, the applicant has the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. The proposed use will be funded through a business line of credit through that savings institution as well as personally financed by the owner. I, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and hours of operation. Um, the proposed use will thoroughly comply with the Good Neighbor Ordinance, in particular with the generation of noise and hours of operation, just as the existing farm has and will continue to do. So when you currently have the events that you're having now, do they, how late do they typically go? Um, they vary, but anywhere from seven to nine. Do you see any changes in that? I mean, you know, I, I, I see other farms doing events and doing weddings and things like that and going later. Do you think that with this new venue and things like that, that you'll be having events that will be going later? Um, I'd never say never, um, but our goal is to keep it to nine. Uh -huh. I have a question. Yes. Um, with regard, um, just with, with uh, regard to noise and um, proximity of other homes in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, I think it's Fairway Lane or something like that that's right behind you folks. Yeah, Fairway Drive. Yeah, Fairway Not Drive. Um, the, uh, with the idea of um, if there were a condition put on, say, that <clears throat> any amplified music or amplified entertainment had to be shut off by 9 o'clock p.m., mm -hmm. would that be something that you guys would be uh, comfortable adhering to? Yeah. Amenable to? Okay. Because yeah, like, from my perspective, um, and uh, also as, as a musician, the uh, going to uh, events and weddings and things like that when they can last until 9, 10, 11, midnight or something like that. Right. And because you're in such a densely uh, packed area, um, then uh, that's great that you're able to be, uh, uh, you're willing to do that. So that might be a uh, restriction that we would put on a condition rather that any kind of activity would have to cease by 9 o'clock. Yeah, yeah. I'm I mean, our neighbors have been our neighbors for a very long time. Sure. <laughs> and, you know, we do our best to be good neighbors. I know it's tricky sometimes with trucks backing in and, you know, us going about business as usual. But, you know, we try and be really conscious of what we're doing, when we're doing, what we have to do, you know. So I want to continue to live happily alongside our neighbors. Because uh, awesome. I live right next to the farm as well. So it's, you know... Yeah. It's my home too. So I think Great. as an additional color commentary as well, we um, I'm sorry. As additional color commentary to this, we, we did have a special consult on this matter. I'm I'm fairly new working at the farm. I happen to be married to a Portland police lieutenant who works ten PM to eight AM. So he's experienced with noise calls and events. So it's obviously we're not rock row. I mean we're <laughs> right. going to expand baby showers and workshops and fundraisers. I mean this is mm -hmm. the goal to expand. Um, but we had that conversation with him about when you get these phone calls, what do you do? What is the determining level? Um, something he's done for 13 years. So we are. Well, what we don't want is our 
police to be getting those calls. Exactly. Right? Because, yeah. I mean, my understanding, and maybe Mr. Longstaff can tell me, I'm not quite sure who actually gets notice of these sort of appeals. You know, so the people who live two houses down have no idea that you want to start having weddings and venues and things like that. And um, I, 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 will you be having live music? Are you going to have like a, like a stage and dance floor and things like that? There are no stage plans. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we had talked about the community events, mm -hmm. you know, and just like things to bring the neighborhood together, but no real details about that, whether it would be live music or a barbecue or, a, you know, whatever. So no right. live music, definitely no stage plans. Mm -hmm. um, and if there were, <clears throat> if there were music or anything like that, or any kind of activity or entertainment that would be contained to the inside, the interior right. of the greenhouse. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah, which the way it's structured has more of a buffer on the back and the side um, with our closest neighbors. Right. By design. Sure. Um, so, yeah, we we're taking that all into consideration for sure. Great. Thank you. The music will be inside the building, mm -hmm. and it's it's air conditioned, or is it, you said that the buildings get really hot. Uh, the that way the old one was built, yes. Okay. But the new one will have different types of roof vents, and um, the front wall is retractable. Right. Uh, or roll up. And have you spoken to any of your neighbors about this? I mean, you said you live there, and so are they aware that you want to start doing bigger events that might go later into the night and things like that? Yeah, I've talked to a couple of my neighbors. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, um, I, don't, I didn't go door to door. Yeah. Everybody, no, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a residential neighborhood behind you, and I just think, you know, my kids are in bed by 7.30, and I just would be very upset if, you know, on a, you know, when my kids are tired on a Friday and I'm listening to music past 8, 8.30, um, your neighbors are pretty close. I don't know if we can look at like a bigger picture of what it's like. I mean, I understand you're there, but I mean, you say you're not Rock Row, but I mean, you know, you also are in a, in a residential neighborhood and there's a nice new development behind you with families and kids and you yourself, you know, have a family and I know you don't want it loud, but you're making the choice to do it. And some of these folks around here might not want something like that. Um, what sort of barrier do you have between you and that development behind you? Is it just the row of trees? There's quite a row of trees there right now. Yeah, a mix of evergreens and deciduous um, and undergrowth mm -hmm. on all three sides. I have a question for uh, Brian, our code enforcement officer. Uh, what is the noise standard in this neighborhood? In this, excuse me, in this uh, residential zone? What is the noise standard? Yes. Is there a decibel standard and mm -hmm. measured at what point? If it's if it's music you're referring to? Any kind of noise. Uh, I, I don't know the answer. Okay. To the we Could have I, a good neighbor ordinance that spells yeah. out noise oh, standards. Yeah, so yeah, yeah that's probably in there. I, well, I remember here. having an appeal a few months ago. Uh, the uh, power company wanted to build something and they did include that information in their presentation. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, it was 95 decibels. Uh, well, that was I made wrong. That was an industrial use. That's an, but there were neighboring homes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and it's measured at the property line. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, there are standards somewhere, okay, that you would have to comply with. Mm -hmm. Well, and right. actually, it says right here in her response that the proposed use will comply with the good neighbor ordinance. Yeah. And so I think as long as that's that's going to, you know. Be yep. affirmed. I, th I don't. We reviewed the ordinance, like I said. We informally consulted with someone who gets called to these in Portland on a nightly basis, um, discuss those technical details. And I also think while this is something we are completely cognizant of and are going to follow the rules, I do want to emphasize that that, you know, if you're looking at, again, this is an expansion of the events we have now, there's how many of them have music at all? <laughs> This is not something that is dealt with daily, but we are 100% prepared to deal with it moving forward, but certainly not a focus of the events that we're talking about. Okay. And you're, if, if I understand correctly too, your intent really is to con continue in the character of the type of venue that you have now, 
which would be much more family oriented and conducive to home style kind of life. I, I would assume, is that correct to, to assume that? Yeah. Okay. I also understood you was saying earlier that um, you've had several requests for showers and weddings. Mm -hmm. And that's something you haven't traditionally done in the past, is that correct? Right. <coughs> so you wanted to have the capability of doing those things? Yeah. We've Thank done you. a few showers okay. um, in our smaller state. And again, it's not uncommon for showers to happen in a residential neighborhood as well. So mm -hmm. I, would, I would be more concerned with what's the maximum capacity that you expect any of these events to actually achieve? Do you, um, do you, have, a, a, do you have a ceiling or that you really think, feel like you would be putting on it? I max is 150. That's, that's quite a few people. So you're going to advertise the venue as having a max capacity of 150, is what you're saying? Yes. Okay. And I guess I circle, I mean, I guess different people carpool and they come together. It's a lot more than parking spaces that you currently have. Actually, when, when um, businesses are evaluated, such as a restaurant, you know, there are standards as to how many uh, parking spaces uh, per capacity of the restaurant. And I think that, uh, Ryan, you're going to have to help me with this one because I'm not sure what the number is, but I'm going to guess it's probably somewhere in the area of two and a half people per parking spot. Is, it, is that close? Well, we have off-street parking standards in our zoning yeah. ordinance, and okay. it depends on the use and the activity. Right. Uh, some of it's based on gross leasable space, some of it's um, based on net leasable space. Yeah. Um, residential is based on two, you know, uh, for a two, two person apartment. Uh, but for this like kind one of and use. And a half, uh, yeah, for one bedroom apartments, one yeah. and a half spaces. Yeah, but for a big yeah. building like this, you know. We'd have to look at that. Yeah, uh, and, and that would really be, would that be the, the fire marshal who would uh, determine that number? Fire marshal would probably have to review this. They'd also have to get a special amusement permit. They'd also have to get, um, uh, or they might not have to do it, but their vendors would have to have liquor licenses. Yeah, and of course. All of that. All right, so that's that's well covered, you know, by the town. Yeah. Okay. So in other words, our charge is primarily just figuring out whether it's okay to move this building and do the activity, yeah. the initial activity, yeah. with the understanding that there will be other permits that are piggybacked on top of this that are required. Is that correct? Right. With the exception, as I said in the opening comments, they, they, don't, they do not have to go through site plan review because they are right. exempt as a commercial agricultural establishment. Right. Okay. So we would, we would be looking at all the other public safety factors. Um, if there are over 100 um, people gathering, they fall under our public assembly um, ordinance. They have to provide the police department with a uh, staffing plan and other things. I can't remember all of the all of the things that are mentioned in there, but that's part of what they'll have to do in order to do business. Okay. And you're aware of that? Mm -hmm. They Seems are now. To be. <laughs> well. I don't know those details. <clears throat> um, so anytime you want to have a wedding of over, or an, an event of over 100 people, you have to then register. And if you want music or things like that, you're going to have to have additional permits as well, right? The special amusement yeah. permit would be. Yeah, okay. so that's a whole other so category. Covered. Yes. All right. I am not familiar with the good neighbor ordinance so much. Maybe I'm not a good neighbor. Um, I don't, um, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I don't know if there's like a time, you know, like after this time, we don't do things. Um, it's 10 o'clock on Friday and Saturday nights, 9 o'clock through, throughout the week for okay. evening. And so I think that's something that we need to discuss. Um, does the board have any more questions for the applicant at this time? Right. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm all set. Those were all my questions. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to now open this up to the public. I don't know if there's anyone who would like to speak at this time. Can you give us your name and Good address? evening. My name is Pat Lefebvre. 
and I live at 3 Fairway Drive, which directly abuts the property. There's a little scrub in between, and that's about the extent of it. <clears throat> Consequently, as of course you're well aware, I and some of my neighbors received the official notice. Put my glasses back on. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, asking for a special exception for Highland Avenue greenhouses for an additional greenhouse to be used for seasonal event space. And as I think is made clear, obviously, they've already moved the greenhouse. I mean, you know, there's no reason why the greenhouse as a structure would be an issue. But I did wonder exactly what is the special event space? What does that uh, mean? So I did come over to the uh, planning board department and they were very helpful and I thanked them very much. And I did look at the uh, appeal very much as you ladies and gentlemen are doing so. And I have a couple of things I would like to say. As I think has been established, <clears throat> the existing principal use is as a commercial agriculture. And it's under the standards that uh, some questions were raised as far as I was concerned. Uh, under A, I, I didn't hear, but I do believe I copied this correctly, the site to be used 10 to 15 times per year. Uh, one of the things was that some of these seemed rather broad. And again, I was very appreciative when I was at the office. The people told me that if I had any other questions, I should uh, contact Mr. Brian Longstaff, which I did, and I do appreciate he was most helpful, and I, I thank him also. And he did, and correct me if I misinterpret you, but I think take the same I look that I had there, that is not specific. Probably this would be quite successful if in that period of time it was decided to have 20 uh, events, I think, that would have to be specifically written in as to how many, otherwise it's rather broad in some of the, uh, the language, yes. I might say so. Uh, under C, what you have referred to, which is exactly why we're here this evening, so to speak, uh -huh. it does indeed say, uh, it, the request was for hostessing, or hosting existing educational and social events and, and functions, in parentheses that says, necessary to commercial agriculture. And the, again, rather broad but interesting factor, as was just said, was for farm customers and workshop attendees. I think one has to assume, and it probably would be very popular, that if people wanted to use the venue, it would not be limited to any specific people. I mean, all you've got to do is buy a plant and you're a customer. So I think that legality comes in. And of course, as you said, it goes on to say that they would wish to host company parties, receptions, anniversaries, family reunions, baby showers, none of which have anything to do with agriculture. Uh, again, I was told, and I do appreciate about the fact that it couldn't even be done without the special uh, amusement permit, mm -hmm. because it's assumed that in most of these there certainly would be um, entertainment, music, or such would be would be wanted. The uh, parking there is quite a bit, but it's very. As I say, I live next door. There's lots uh, in and out. I, can't see that they could have events going on quite at the same time, not 150 people coming in and still parking while there was a regular uh, usage there. Something that I appreciate, it's been basically mentioned, but I will just refer again, the abutters, I live in, um, obviously, on Fairway Drive and Pleasant Hill Woods. We are 29 <coughs> single-family homes in a residential community. The abutters on the other side are Magnolia Place, and I can't give you an exact number, but I'm quite certain there must be at least 50 homes there. Uh, they're single residential owned by people who are 55 or over. 
the area is residential. It once was all farming when I lived here in 1977. That was another time. I assumed that that probably had to be rezoned to become specifically residential. And in looking over those things, what I am respectfully saying is that to be asked to create a special entertainment venue for hosting events, which a lot of the time wouldn't have anything to do with agriculture, and which would be situated in the middle of 100 single-family homes does not seem appropriate to me. I thank you for your time and for listening to me. Thank you. I appreciate your time, too. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Good evening. My name is Jeff Bertman. I live at 15 Fairway Drive. Um, if you were to expand the map, you'll see that I live on that cul-de-sac um, on the opposite side, but I have a pretty direct line of sight. Uh, you can see that the area is treed as it extends uh, behind my home to the lot on 31 Fairway Drive. It's fairly treed as it looks over toward the greenhouse property, but just to the left of that, if you uh, bring the arrow down further down Fairway Drive, uh, that's pretty open. There is tree, there is scrub there, uh, but that would be pretty open to uh, where my house and most of the houses in our neighborhood sit, uh, which is where the proposed venue location would be. Um, as Pat indicated, we are a neighborhood, uh, a residential community of 29 homes um, in Magnolia Place. Uh, behind us, If you again, if you were to expand out beyond our uh, cul-de-sac on the opposite side, uh, you see quite a few more residential homes, Schooner Drive, um, and in and around the, the Pleasant Hill neighborhood. So you can see that there are a number of residential homes. With regard to things that we hear um, as a regular um, occurrence during the summer months, we can regularly hear, right over my shoulder here, um, and probably sing along to uh, events at the Thursday Summer Concert Series, which we can hear pretty regularly. Um, we have the train that goes through, um, which we hear pretty loud and clear. Um, we can even hear, if the wind is blowing right, we can hear Beach Ridge Motor Speedway, uh, which right. is three or four miles away. My home sits probably 200 yards as the crow flies from this proposed venue center. So my concern would be um, uh, educational programs and things along those of that nature would probably be fine, but I don't know of many wedding receptions where the music cuts off at nine o'clock and things wind down or what have you. Um, you know, wedding showers typically probably don't get too raucous and everything, but the concern would be uh, things that go into the evening hours after dark, um, literally on our back doorstep. Thank you yep. for your time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nancy Matson, and I live at 5 Fairway Drive. Um, I don't know if you can see it on the map. Yes. Right there. Yes, uh -huh. that's you. Right there. <laughs> so my concern is about, you know, not about um, workshops or, or things that have to do with agriculture. It's a lovely, a lovely greenhouse, you know, an asset to the community. Um, really beautiful place, but I feel like this special uh, permit has nothing to do with agriculture. It has more to do with having an event center. Um, and the way the language is, anything could happen. Um, there's nothing to restrain the number of events we have. We could literally, the way things are written, we could have an event every day. Uh, there's nothing about the uh, limit to um, the noise, um, it would mean that I would never be able to have my windows open. My house shakes when my neighbors play music. Um, my deck, my backyard, as well as the people in Magnolia Place, all of their decks face that way. There's, we hear everything. And, um, you know, so that's, that's a very, 
that's my concern is the noise yep. and also the fact that I think it would harm our property values to be next to something that created and had the potential to create such a lot, such a large amount of noise. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and Olson, one fairway drive, uh, with all due respect to my neighbors, I, I really don't have a problem with, uh, with this um, pr proposition uh, proposal. Um, um, th these are young people that are trying to, to build their business um, economically. Uh, you know, we, we need to, to further these kind of things. And, and I, Nancy particularly is the closest. I, I understand her concerns on this and noise. But it seems to be that the noise ordinances would take care of this. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, we just need to get along and, and, and it's up to you folks how you want to decide. I, I just want to say I don't have a problem with it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak tonight? Did we receive any letters or emails? Okay. I'm going to close the public hearing. And now the board is going to discuss the application and do the findings of facts and conclusions of law. <clears throat> so A, the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reasons of sewage disposal or emissions to the air or water or other aspects of its design and operation. Uh, the applicant did a good job explaining exactly how they're going to be using the portable bathroom trailers. And then they would only be specifically on the, on the place just for those events and then removed. I appreciate that. I don't know if anyone has any comments. Uh, no. Ms. Torrance. I, I feel like they've, um, like their proposal has addressed that adequately. As was shared, there are other accessible um, restroom facilities on site that are existing. Um, depending upon the use and the time of the event, the projected occupancy, additional facilities would be provided, as was shared, so I do not see any concerns with A. I agree. <clears throat> um, stated in the application and spoken here this evening, um, the bathroom trailer, um, the portable bathroom trailer, would be hauled in and out based on the event, if it's even needed, if there is, even is an event on that particular day. Um, so there's no really uh, opportunity to create unsanitary and unhealthful conditions. The trailer's not going to be there for all six months of the summertime um, that's taken away afterwards and then uh, mm -hmm. through licensed vendors. Um, similarly, um, this may not go to unsanitary and healthy, but any food or alcohol vendors that come in, they said they would have to be licensed, and per the town, they would have to have special permits for that as well. So I believe that is covered. Right. I agree. Okay. <clears throat> yep. I mean, I don't feel that there would be any changes in the air or water emissions. Uh, all in favor of A being met? That's fine. B, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when adding to the existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Um, the applicant is represented. They have 87 spots. I'm sure they can get 87 cars in there. Um, they are, however, proposing to change to do different uses and now want to do a capacity of 150, which would be different. Um, I don't know if they've, does the board feel they've demonstrated that won't be unsafe. So I, I feel like the requirement that they would need to obtain additional permitting for anything in excess of 100 people is adequate to address this, this concern. Um, you know, I think 87 parking spots for 100 people is a very reasonable number. Um, Oftentimes, if you've got an event that's going to address 150 people, I think you're probably going to be dealing with 87 spots still being quite adequate. 
Um, but I, I feel comfortable enough in the fact that there is going to be a second level of supervision and, and oversight on this particular topic. But, uh, the comment I'd like to make is uh, I'm very impressed with the fact that they're doing this in order to build sales during <coughs> a, a very slow time of the year. <clears throat> in fact, in between seasons, in between the spring and fall seasons. It's a way of filling in a slow time. And during these times, there's traditionally only about maximum number of six cars parked right there where they're talking about doing this. So there are a lot of empty spaces. And, and again, I, you know, based on my knowledge of what you need, how many people come in per car, it's, it is an average of around two and a half people per car. Um, I mean, some more, some less, obviously. But that's more than enough parking. And also, I don't think it'll put any undue uh, burden on uh, access or egress on Highland, which is, of course, a busy street. But at the same time, this is during what's otherwise a slow time of the year for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, it's not going to be any different than during their peak time in April and May. And uh, because of that, you know, I agree they're satisfying the, uh, this particular criterion. I agree. I don't see any issues with the proposed increase um, in occupancy and parking for those in attendance, um, as well as any issues with the traffic in and out of the site. I'll add to that as well that they've um, stated that there's the pumpkin festival that they have in October where they had 900 people sort of cycle through that property in a day. Uh, which is impressive, which is quite impressive. And um, so with that, you know, there's already traffic there and there haven't been any historical issues during that time of year with this. Uh, also piggybacking on uh, Dave's point and, and others made, um, you know, 87 spots, well, you know, you would have to, there'd be quite a few people, if you have two people per car, they would exceed the occupant level there. Um, and uh, so, yeah, those are the biggest the biggest points that I wanted to uh, make there. All in favor of B being met. C, the proposed use will not create public safety problems, which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree of municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. Well, the applicant has represented that they already are doing some of these events there and they haven't run into any problems. Um, I do have some concerns about having events where there's, you know, we talk about the 900 flowing in and out, but this is an event where there's all people coming at once and leaving at once. Um, I don't think substantially that would create any sort of problem, but I'm not sure. Um. My opinion on this is that even if they were, even if you have an event, people still typically, if you've got a big event, a lot, most people do not leave all at the same time. Right. They stagger. They arrive, they arrive staggered and they leave staggered. Um, They'll leave when the music goes off. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't see this as, as being any increased burden on public safety. Um, than what's, what's currently being done at the property. I agree with that. I don't see it being substantially different than what the existing uses are uh, currently housed on the, at the site. Um, in addition to that, as was previously shared, uh, should anything above 100 uh, protected people be uh, foreseen or anticipated, there would be those additional steps um, and permits required. Um, one point I would like to make that they mentioned um, in the event, and Rudy, you brought this question up early, in the event of an emergency, should emergency vehicles need to get there, they do, or they are, <laughs> excuse me, they're able to have access to the site. Uh, the applicant stated that they have had fire trucks on site in the past uh, during October, uh, during the Pumpkin Festival. So to me, that's a clear indication that the site is able to withstand traffic of an emergency vehicle that would have to get in there should there be an emergency. Um, so uh, in addition to that, going back to my earlier point of, again, 900 people going through a day during 
October for this pumpkin festival. Um, granted, this will be a little bit different if they have uh, late afternoon, early nighttime uh, events, but I'll, I'll touch upon that when I get to the letter I for my explanation, but I'll note that the applicant stated that they would be an amenable to uh, a restriction based on time for any sort of amplified entertainment to be shut down. Um, and I mentioned 9 o'clock and they had meant, said that that would possibly be a solution. That way there is a designated time when everything would shut off um, and 9 o'clock would be a little bit early. We could discuss that whatever the time is at that point, but 9 o'clock is earlier than 10, which I think 10 o'clock is in the Good Neighbor Ordinance. A weekend, yeah. So um, there is there is that just in respect to the early networks. You know, under C though, it, it says it, would it require substantially greater degree of municipal fire or police protection? I mean, protection. I look at this as are they going to get more phone calls? And I, I don't know if under this one you would. I, I do feel like they would be getting phone calls. We just heard from neighbors. So I mean, I think there will be an increase if suddenly they're doing bigger events, and even if the neighbors know there's a good neighbor ordinance and it's, they're going to have to stop at 9 o'clock, but they think it's too loud and it's 7 o'clock. Um, I do have some concerns about that issue, um, of calling on the police and the police unnecessarily having to come because they neighbors feel it is too loud, and that's what we're already kind of hearing is that we don't want it loud. Um, so I do have concerns in that, um, but you guys obviously are good neighbors and you've been living there for a long time and want to be, remain good neighbors. Anyone has any I, I would add to the, just to, to add on to what you were saying, mm -hmm. there, there are existing um, regulations in the township for dealing with uh, police uh, issues as well as um, sound levels and so forth uh, that are in effect and are very reasonable and if individual members of, of, of the community don't know what they are, I'm sure the police can explain it to them very quickly. And, you know, and it is not necessary for police to come out if it's just within standards. Uh, and uh, I would hope it would be. I mean, we're not talking about rock concerts here, like Rock Row. Uh, I know there are a lot of problems in Westbrook right mm -hmm. now, but that's not what we're talking about here. No, but there, there were, it's a residential neighborhood that was approved to do live music. Yeah, and now the, standards the police are throwing up point. their hands and saying the town gave them the permission to do this. And so we today, board, are in, we are in that position where we're the ones giving them permission to now start doing bigger events. And I foresee this doing great. Who doesn't want to have an event? And I mean, we've seen the other places in Scarborough do very well with this. I think they'll do very well, but I could see it getting a little out of control. And so I, you know, I don't want our police to be, you know, having to come out there or our residents to have to be told, no, it's not our problem. Um, I, I think there's a vast difference between Rock Row or a situation anywhere close to that and a, a max capacity of 150 people, and and a an ordinance that, or you know, an expectation that they're going to abide by the good neighbor ordinance, um, and and respect that, and, and there's you know would be a qualification for that. Um, I, I don't I don't see that this is uh, going to get into the same hot water as that whole situation did. Right. If I may add to that, um, with, res <clears throat> with respect to that point, um, I think it is it's our 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 job to to allow to allow this or not. Um, but I think there's a compromise that could be made here. I think there's a middle ground that could be reached between uh, the residents and the folks here from uh, uh, Highland Farm. I mean, I think we just impose just some strict conditions on the time that they can operate, um, the functions, any kind of function or amplified entertainments contained to the principal, I'll say the, not principal building, but the new building, the new greenhouse that's interior to it, so that there wouldn't be uh, you know, an opportunity to set up shop outside and start playing music that way. Um, we could also uh, make it a continue, um, condition that there needs to be some additional plantings planted at the edge of the field to help create that buffer or reinforce that buffer even visually as well. Um, give that a few years and that can grow and, and really and really block that. Um, and then depending on, uh, and I would ask Brian to weigh in on this one if, when we get to this point, but you know, we can say no vehicles will be allowed to park street side 
in front of this, uh, in front of this event, you'd have to park inside, um, inside the place where all the vehicles will be contained to the parking lots. And granted, not everybody's perfect. Someone's going to bend the rules, but if they're cognizant and just go out and say like, "Hey, you need to move your car," um, things like that. So I think we can we can reach a middle ground here by by imposing some conditions and requirements as part of a possible approval of this appeal. Is there a sidewalk there? And so then what, right down the street is a school, right? Okay, so you really wouldn't want people parking along the road because then people who would be walking to the school right. would then be walking in the road. Okay. The only thing I would add to imposing additional conditions is I don't think it's necessary at all unless it's something that is not covered within the existing um, requirements that have been established for the town. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, there are uh, standards established. The good neighbor you know, stipulates 9 p.m. on weekdays, 10 p.m. on weekends, if I understand it correctly. And I think we're really out of our bounds to start imposing standards. I absolutely agree with you on that um, for, for several reasons. Number one being that any, uh, you know, I'm in a band. I mean, if I decided I wanted to practice until 10 a.m. or 10 p.m. at night, on a Saturday night in my own garage, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Right. But because it's a business that's, that's you know, operating, I also feel like we're, we're jumping the gun to the fact that there's going to be live music at these events and things like that. I, you know, we're, we're failing to allow for the approval for an amusement permit to actually be granted. And I, I think we're outside of our boundaries on, and, and jumping ahead um, into a domain that's not ours to be ruled, re legislated on. I think, you know, we're, we're discussing whether the potential for having these events is, is going to be allowed to be there. There's going to be another layer that is going to define what the boundaries are of those events. And I don't think that's under our jurisdiction. That's just my opinion. May I? Um, Let's go ahead. Make a comment um, to build off what was just shared. Um, my opinion is um, a bit mixed and it is in agreement with the established standards of the Good Neighbor Ordinances um, and other additional permitting um, and steps that would have to be required. However, as the special exception is looking for uh, perhaps any changes to what's currently being done. Uh, with the agricultural or educational facilities. Um, to that end, any increased or addition of noise, music, live music, um, amplified music, um, I tend to see as a change um, beyond what's existing. Um, so with regard to imposing any conditions, um, that can certainly be discussed when we get to I, but um, my opinion is that I don't think that it's, um, it's certainly within um, our realm to do today. Okay. So all in favor of C being Matt. D, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies. Uh, the applicant did a good job of explaining how they're going to be moving a building and actually cutting down on erosion a little bit because they will not be farming that area that they were previously farming before. Ms. Torin? Yeah, I believe they've adequately addressed this issue and, and, um, and I'm sure that given the nature of their business and their, they have an additional concern and that they would, and an additional um, benefit to actually making sure that what they do is, is responsible in that regard, so I have no problem with this one. I agree, I do not see any adverse effects with water supplies. Um, if they're moving a portion of the existing greenhouse to a different location, any projected water usage uh, may overall be the same, um, and they're gonna have the uh, truckable uh, restrooms as needed. Right. Um, I would say that uh, Building off of what Ruby just said, and, and Melinda, um, you're taking down a section of the greenhouse and you're building another one there. So I won't say it's a wash as far as 
um, building coming down, coming back up, but that effort is being made. Um, I would also, uh, if it previously being used as a greenhouse, if active, I would say that there would be less water usage because it won't be a dedicated space for um, growing plants and things like that. Whereas this would just, this, they wouldn't be growing, they wouldn't be having a greenhouse out here in the middle of the field. It would just be, a, it would be the, the, the event space that not necessarily would be used all the time. Um, lastly, uh, nope, that was it. That's all I have. Thank you. Now, to me, the key point is because there's less till land, there's less erosion. Okay. All in favor of D being met? <coughs> E, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. I'm, the applicant has done this, shown us that they're proposing to just move a greenhouse from one area to another. Um, so the visual impact will be different. And um, because now it looks like there's going to be, I think as the neighbor was saying, he was behind it, and now there's going to be a greenhouse closer to him, and this greenhouse will be doing a different use than what was being done in the greenhouse before, and holding events and things like that, um, compatible to the existing uses in the neighborhood. Um, you know, I think they're trying to do what they can with the farm area they have, and it is allowed under as a special exception. I see it as being no more, no less compatible than the current use. And I think that's where my definition would be, is that I, I don't believe that there's anything that's so significantly changing in the visual, uh, the visual impact or the intensity uh, that would really cause me to have a concern about this particular aspect. I also do not see any concerns with this aspect E. Um, it's compatible with existing uses, physical size, relocating on site, visual impact, it's a greenhouse versus the other greenhouses, uh, intensity of use, while we have been discussing the number of 150, as previously shared, 900 or projected, or in the historically have potentially passed through the site proximity to other structures, it's still centrally located, adjacent to other greenhouses, so I don't see any issues with this. I agree, Rudy. Uh, a similar point with me. Um, all these structures are already more or less in place. You already have greenhouses there, you already have equipment there, you already have an operation that's been going on there for many years. Um, they're removing a section of the building and building another portion of the building, again previously sort of washed as far as square footage is concerned more or less. Um, and then they already have events here, like you said, Rudy, 900 people coming and going during Pumpkin Fest. And, um, and there hasn't been uh, a point stated tonight that there have been any issues right. with that event that has gone on um, that anyone has voiced here tonight, which I would like to know. Uh, to me, it just does not change the character at all. Uh, if anything, it does improve the, uh, you know, the physical appearance because if, from what I've seen in the drawings, this entire area, the structure itself and the, the grounds around it will be very, very attractive and appealing to, you know, to anybody who were to look at it. All in favor of E being met. F, if located in a shoreland zone. They are not located in the shoreland zone. All in favor of that. G, the applicant has sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. The applicant has represented that they are the owner of the property and they have provided a deed as well. I think the deed that's provided is sufficient to establish ownership and the, the right to use the property. No comment. Nothing to add there. No comment. All in favor of G being met. H. The applicant has the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of the section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. 
and has represented that they do have the technical and financial ability. They already have a successful business on there, and represented that they're able to get a line of credit and do personal financing themselves. Um, I don't know if we would be imposing any sort of conditions that might incur more costs. Um, I know we have neighbors here tonight, and I don't know if it's unreasonable for us to ask them to maybe put something up so they can protect the neighbors more, be it a fence or some trees or something. Um, you know, these people bought a house next to a farm, and I think there's definitely some concerns that we've heard tonight about the visual impact of seeing now parties out in the middle of a field and the noises that they would be hearing. Um, I do believe that they do have the financial ability, though. Mm -hmm. No comment. I think, I think that's fine. I also see no issues with this. It's shared the 17th anniversary, but certainly a great foundation that they've built upon a successful business. Um, with my comment that I'd like to add to this, again, as stated, they have a business line of credit through Bath Savings Institution. Um, they stated earlier that they would be okay with any conditions imposed on them by the board, and they would have the financial capability to meet those. Um, also, I'll point out, uh, you know, with regard if, if, if there were a condition to put up some extra additional plantings or trees or something like that uh, on the periphery of the property to help sort of break up or not break up, but try to eliminate or reduce the visual impact from there. I'll also note on one of the uh, <coughs> um, conceptual rendering plans that were that were shown here, there is their parking spaces. Uh, there's this one, Brian, if you want to bring this one up. Uh, I'll point out on here, right there, um, that it appears to be that there are some sizable greenery that's going to be planted between the vehicles and the proposed greenhouse. Um, so that way people pulling into there is a thought uh, to the applicant, making sure that those are high enough, thick enough to sort of block any headlights if people are backing out of there and going on their way. Granted, they're backing out and they'll be driving out to Highland Avenue, but uh, just some considerations that people should think about. I don't think there's any question about financial ability, especially with a project that's going to increase uh, sales and profits. Okay, all in favor of H being met. <clears throat> I. The proposed use will be compatible with the existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and hours of operation. The applicant has said that they will comply with the good neighbor ordinance in, in regards to the noise and hours of operation. We discussed those. We also heard from some neighbors tonight who expressed some of the concerns that I feel any neighbor would have. If I lived there, I would not want to be hearing music or large events you know, into the evening, things like that. When we talk about our authority as the zoning board, this is exactly, we are the only people who are giving them permission to do this. This is the only time that they will be before us for someone to regulate this. So I foresee them having a very successful event venue here. And what we don't want is to decrease the value of the neighbors around them. I mean, you're a realtor. Mm -hmm. You know that the value of the properties are going to decrease if suddenly these neighbors can't open their windows at night. And these neighbors have music going or they have floods of cars going through or things like that or someone took a wrong turn and suddenly they're driving through your neighborhood looping around because they missed the turn or something like that um, and so this is exactly what our job here and this is where I think we need to talk about this because we've had multiple people here tonight who express their concern I mean this is a residential neighborhood and I understand there is a good neighbor ordinance I think 10 p.m. is too late for a residential neighborhood and I open this up to the board to give me their feedback on that. So let's see where to begin. <laughs> um, so a few things. I, I do believe that uh, abiding by the good neighbor ordinance with respect to normal business that they would be conducting at this particular venue, um, if we disregard any concern about live music or amplification, all of the anything that would be required to have a separate permit I think if we if we push that off to the side and we just are looking at the proposed use complying with the good neighbor ordinance 
I, I believe we can't uh, disregard that. I think if, if we are talking because we're making assumptions that they're going to have, have live music or have amplified, you know, an auction or something, you know, I mean, anything that's obnoxious, right? Uh, that's going to require additional permitting that is, is going to put limitations based on what is proposed and the neighbors will have an opportunity again, I believe, to, to um, you know, to uh, discuss that, I think. Um, but the, when I look at, at, a, at a concern like this, I'm looking at this as, I see people have backyard parties all the time. I've been to many, I've performed at many. I see, as I'm sure you have also, um, and I see, you know, I see neighbors have birthday parties, uh, baby showers, wedding showers, all of that stuff is normal residential activity. And what we're talking about is just multiple occurrences of that at the same property. And that also could happen just as easily in a residential property that had nothing to do with a business. So when I look at these things, I try to look at it as how is this being used in a way that's incompatible with a private residence? Well, and do you think we should limit? Because you're talking about like, I have a party once a year with a band. Should we maybe limit? I know people who do that every weekend. I, I do. I, there are there are people that do that every weekend, and then there are other people that never do that. Right. Um, I you know I, I listen to the neighbors, and I'm very sympathetic, but I also listen to them say that they already have problems with noise in the neighborhood, and it's got nothing to do with the farm. Right. And so when I when I hear that, that also tells me that this is not a problem with the business. It's a problem in the neighborhood, maybe with the houses that are, you know, how they were built, I, whatever it is. I'm not saying that it's right. I'm just saying that I, I think we have to be cautious not to penalize one party over uh, another when it comes to their land use. And, and it's just a, it's, it's, it's hard to be consistently s sympathetic. Um, so yes, yeah, so the, the, the things that kind of caught my attention was that there was already complaints about noise from neighbors already being a problem and, and noise from the area being a problem of being able to hear Beach Ridge and other things. Some of that is beyond control. I do think that what we're asking and, and what we need to make sure is very clear is that yes, the applicant is, must comply with the good neighbor ordinance, must comply with any additional restrictions placed upon them from an, emer uh, an amusement permit. Um, and any other licensing or compliance issues that they must need must be done the proper through the proper channels and abided by. I, I think beyond that, I, I see no cause for restricting their use when it's really not incompatible with residential living from a standpoint of what they're offering to do or what they're approaching to do. That's my opinion. Thank you. Um, as uh, previously shared on an earlier comment or <laughs> item, um, my biggest concern with this would be with the amplification of noise. Um, while it would be certainly a benefit if additional trees or vegetation was planted at the perimeter of the uh, property, um, that's something that I not a good, but a great neighbor would consider. <laughs> but at this time, um, just the amplification of noise. Melinda, I mean, Ms. Torrens, do you feel? I mean, I just you are you are a, you are a realtor. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious. You know, I mean, do you feel like if suddenly this ex if they continue to do events and it gets loud, it, it would decrease the value of some of these properties behind there? if the volume increased in the intensity and things like that. Perhaps, Mr. Longstaff, do you have a, a better, uh, how often does one need to apply for an amusement permit? Is that an annual application? Mm -hmm. So the worst case scenario would be that this goes through for a year mm -hmm. and becomes problematic and that amusement permit is pulled and they cannot continue to, to operate in the same way. 
Similarly, each additional year, they're going to have to operate within a certain boundary of behavior that is going to be consistent with allowing people to, to, to be able to be tolerant of what is going on, or else that amusement permit's going to be revoked. And so I do feel confident that that is, is sufficient enough and also, um, I think it's sufficient enough to protect the homeowners and I, I think it's also, I just, I really struggle with, I, I don't think we can go beyond our scope on this one of what we're actually evaluating. And we need to rely on the other departments that are going to follow behind us to establish the additional limitations because they already exist. Explain this amusement permit to me. I'm unaware of how this works. They get a permit for a year through who? The town, the town council. Okay, so the town council issues a permit for a year for them to be able to do these type of events. And it can put so restrictions on. So then if the on. residents are not happy, they can then complain to town council and the town council Precisely. can then not renew the amusement for next year. Precisely. And I believe that the, the town council can also impose certain restrictions, like, such as like an 8, 8 p.m. limitation or something like that, if I, if I understand it correctly. Without getting too far, too far know. into the weeds, right? I think we need to stick to our knitting here. But um, yeah, the, the council has the ability to develop its own criteria for issuing special amusement permits. Right. They have not done so. But they, they can. but they can. It's written into the ordinance that they can. Um, if they, on an annual renewal, if they have received multiple complaints about something, yeah, they, they could do something about that. They could deny the permit. They could impose conditions. They could do other things. Mm -hmm. In all honesty, I have not seen that happen. Mm -hmm. Not seen it happen in terms of not receiving complaints and having them act upon them? or receiving I haven't and seen them impose any conditions or deny a permit based on complaints. And that's, this is where I come back okay. to this is our authority, and I, I know you sometimes feel like maybe this isn't our authority, but this is, and this is kind of where, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, but we, we have the concerns from the neighbors. I, I feel a lot better knowing that there is another check and balance, mm -hmm. that so if this does become a major issue, now the applicants are aware that there are consequences and they can lose it. Mm -hmm. um, which is very helpful to me because I was I, unaware of the details of that. And, and that's part of why I brought this up is right. that I, I think, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of curious, I, I actually am kind of curious, I don't know if it's appropriate to, to ask the neighbors again how they feel about this, if they were aware of this particular, you know, ability to consult the council and and request that they deny a, a special amusement permit, or, or not. is that something you're familiar with? No, I haven't gotten very good information. I'm very thankful when I spoke to the people there. What I'm aware of is that the town council has already issued a Want to go up to the podium? Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, I, 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 hope I, hope I, I hope I didn't I go up. <laughs> and I apologize if I'm out of out of order in asking. We can't, we can't, we can't open do public, public speaking here. right now. Okay. This is going to take all night. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, that's what I was afraid. If I wasn't sure, that's why I was asking if it was appropriate. We're going to go through the chair. Yep. Okay. Um, so. My thought on this yes. is that uh, I mean, you know. Backyard parties aside, yes, average 20, maybe to 50, but we're looking at 150 people that are going to potentially, that are going to be here. Um, the applicant has stated they're going to comply with the Gordon Good Neighbor Ordinance, and they've re emphasized again and again throughout this uh, speak with them this evening that they will be good neighbors and really be cognizant of the issues that are going on there. And I don't see it as any... Um, large issue at all to impose a condition that they plant additional greenery or trees or however whatever it is on the perimeter of their property to break up the sound to break up the visual impact um, and I don't see it it's it is, it is within our scope to impose these types of conditions and I don't think it's unreasonable again we have to compromise here this is in the middle of a residential area um, that 
uh, you know, 10 o'clock might be a little bit too late. Let's, and they've, as I mentioned earlier, 9 o'clock, they seem to nod their head and be amenable to that, so I think that'd be more than reasonable to do it and keep it like that. Okay. Uh, where do I start? <laughs> uh, let's, first thing I'd like to just talk about is noise. Uh, noise is both a subjective and an objective thing. Everybody's perception of noise is different. However, it can be measured in terms of decibels. That's the standard way of measuring noise. And we have regulations in place to do that. And there are limitations as to how much noise can, you know, is acceptable. It, it's up to you know, the, the people who are uh, applying for this, if, if we grant this uh, variance, to stick with that, and they've said they would. The other thing they said they would do is to keep all of the music inside of the building. That's very important because that contains the noise. If it were outdoors, it would broadcast it out into the neighborhood. Uh, and there are already some trees there. I just don't think it's necessary to impose stipulations for additional trees, you know, whatever, okay? I think their landscaping plan is, is very sufficient to make this an attractive property. I, I just do not understand why it would be necessary for us to impose any kind of uh, special restrictions on this. Uh, whatever the uh, your existing good neighbor policy says, if it's uh, nine o'clock except on the weekends, 10 o'clock, then that should be it. We shouldn't say, oh, it's gotta be nine o'clock every night or only eight o'clock or seven. I think that's totally unreasonable. You know, this is within a neighborhood and technically, they're in a, uh, you know, a neighborhood zone, okay? So yes, they have to comply with standards of the neighborhood. And I think that they understand that. Uh, and uh, you know, given the distance between you know, where they are and the neighboring houses, it's much greater than the distance between houses within a subdivision. And, uh, and I think that we all, we're all aware of the fact that in, you know, individuals within a subdivision or any property or apartments for that matter, can have loud parties, okay? So, I mean, this happens, and it, it has to be dealt with, and there are rules to enforce that and regulate it. Uh, I, I'm firmly opposed to any kind of restrictions on noise or anything else in terms of additional landscaping. I think the plan speaks for itself. It's a solid plan, it's very attractive, and I, I believe that, you know, you know, with all the experience uh, the applicants have had running this business over the years, I'm confident they're going to do it the right way. All right. Uh, I could just make a comment based on his. Um, I am in agreement with much of what you shared. And as you've shared uh, tonight, we've heard that the, those representing this are open and agreeable to keeping the music inside. Um, any amplification within the, the greenhouse itself. Um, I personally, my opinion, would just feel comfortable having that in writing. Um, that's, that's all. Yes, I agree. I think making it clarify that the music will always be inside um, would be good to the benefit of the neighbors who are here tonight, who live there and are asking us because they came here tonight and they gave us our time and they've lived in this neighborhood for a long time. And this is the only time that they get to be heard. Yep. This is, and, and I mean no disrespect. So, um, I don't think it's unreasonable for us to do a buffer. We've toyed with the idea in the past, and we should have done one on an appeal in the past. And when I drive by it, I'm like, we really should have made them put up a fence. And, you know, I think we have these neighbors here today, and I think, you know, I don't think it's unreasonable for these folks to try to expand their business and do this, but I think they also need to recognize that this is a different use. Your neighbors are here. You're a good neighbor. Your neighbors want to be heard. They do not want to be hearing this music and you know all this noise. And um, I personally feel that a venue of 100 plus people with live music is very different than a, back, a backyard barbecue. And this is a residential neighborhood and when I look at that lot, it's not that big. And those houses are not that far away and I really don't know how many trees are between your view and that house. And it, um, so, I do feel that we, it would be 
in the benefit to the neighbors and to everyone to make it a qualification that the music remain inside and that it is in writing. I can see it very quickly and very easily getting hot or becoming an issue or just one bride really wants that band outside. Um, you know, and um, I think try to find a compromise again because this is a very residential neighborhood and they're surrounded by houses and by a school and things like that. I, I'd like to add one more, th or a couple more things. One, I don't think it's really, I, I think maybe imposing music beyond a certain hour of the day be contained inside, but I, I don't believe that we should force somebody that, you know, if they're going to do a, an afternoon thing or something like that, they may want to have a little acoustic music even outside that might be amplified, and I don't believe it should have to be throttled back just because we've said that we, everything has to ha occur inside, especially if it's like one to three or something like that. So I think just let's let's weigh that into our, 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 our thinking about these things. What about music inside after a certain hour? I, I, can I, I, I have no idea. I'm just throwing yeah, something let me, out there. Let me finish my other yeah. thought, too. One of the things that I know very, very well about this business is that they thrive on the community members that are surrounding them, and that is their customer base. And they are not, I do not see them being foolish enough to tick off their customer base. I, I just don't see that happening. I think that there, there's, there's an additional layer of politeness that is going to happen naturally and organically just based on the fact that they are neighbors in the, in, of their property that we're talking about. Um, and the neighbors that visit this establishment now and support it year round are the, are the people that are gonna be at, either at odds with this or, or you know. Um, I just that's so that's just one other thing that weighs into my decision making or my my thoughts about this is that um, you know I think they'd be out of business pretty quick if they took ticked off the neighbors I, I just right, well or I live next to a business that is very local and has proceeded to upset all the neighbors and they don't care because they're making lots of money now okay. and so you know you okay. kind of have to look at it um, down the road a little uh, do we Yes. Madam Chair, I, I would recommend at this point um, we move on. We move to approve the appeal, and then and once we're in that, we can have a discussion and then impose any conditions yes. that we vote on those individually at that point yes. or not. So, with that said, I move to approve appeal number two six six one. Do a vote yet? Oh, sorry. No, oh, sorry. on uh, the last. Sorry. Oh, that's right. right. We didn't. Yeah. <clears throat> so we need to vote on I. So I. So all in favor. We have a motion. I would like to move to approve appeal number 2661. Second. Okay, so um, now we're in the discussion portion of the, of the motion. Uh, at this time, I would like to uh, um, um, I would like to move to add the condition that any amplified entertainment be contained to the greenhouse itself. Amplified entertainment. I'll second that. I, I disagree with that. I think anything maybe perhaps after 6 p.m. I would be in, in favor of, but uh, it, during the day, it's gonna get blistering hot in a greenhouse in the middle of summer, and instruments don't like that anyway, and y you would basically be limiting their business to a certain degree at that point. I, we're, we're in it when I don't feel it's necessary. I think, you know, you've got decibel limits. I, I think, you know, if we wanted to set a time that's, you know, after, at dusk or, or, you know, or at 6 p.m., anything beyond that must be in the greenhouse, I'd be fine with that. I think that seems reasonable. Okay, so then I'll um, amend, uh, amend my condition to, uh, state that amplified music is to um, and I wouldn't listen to music either I would any amplification can't be used at, um, after 6 p.m. outside electronic amplification cannot be used 
outside of the proposed greenhouse after 6 p.m. Seems good. I, I'm in favor of that. That's a second. Okay. That's a second. Sorry. After 6 p.m. After 6 p.m. Then it would have to be contained to the principal structure. I agree with that. I'm, more, I'm comfortable with that now, knowing the neighbors have other remedies to deal if this becomes out of control. Yeah. I am. Yes. And with, and with that, I don't see the need to put in place. They have to be done, done by a certain time. They can go by the good neighbor ordinance at that point. Correct. Correct. Because everything will be contained to the principal structure, the new structure that's going to be on site. So I guess is that mm -hmm. approved? We vote on it. We so vote on the condition. So motion to approve with the condition? Yeah. And you have that written down, Doreen? Okay. okay. So an additional condition um, uh, I would like to impose is uh, that the applicant um, plant additional uh, greenery, whether it's a tree or a bush or something like that on the periphery of their property adjacent to uh, the neighbors on the extent of their boundary, property boundary. And again, this is all for the purpose of a compromise. Do you have a slide to show what that looks like? Not necessarily covering the entire boundary, but if there are gaps on the tree line, that is the intent of this uh, aren't there, uh, condition. Aren't there north, south, east, west uh, photos showing the tree lines from ground level instead of from the air? I'm not sure which direction it is. That's looking at it from the north, right? Yeah, so you're looking at the back. Are you, are you facing north? Facing north. Facing, facing north. north. Yeah. So that's facing towards the road. That's no. from the venue, right? Yeah. Yeah. Facing yes. towards And there seems to be a substantial amount of greenery there already in place, but some, some, mature tree. some mm -hmm. supplemental stuff that could be put out there. Again, a good gesture. So this view would be facing toward the east, which would be the neighbors over here. Or over here. Over there, yeah. What kind of, um, how, many square, or how many feet are we talking about? I'd rather not get into that. I'd like no, to leave I, that I'm up to just, the, but it's, it makes a difference as far as whether we impose this or not. It certainly yeah. does, but I'd like to leave that up to the, um, I would like to leave that up to the discretion of the applicant for how many brush or trees that they think would be necessary to plant out there. And Might again, be a good conversation with a neighbor. A good conversation <laughs> with a neighbor. It's a very. It is kind of open. It's a very it's open one that would be hard to do. All right, um, so we don't have a second. Would you ask for a second yet? No. Uh, there is no second on it, so it's not really anything yet, unless someone really wants to force the issue on that. I'm not quite sure how we would enforce that. Yeah, and plus it's yeah, also a little bit over ended. So I, I, we don't necessarily have to go with that one then. It's just we can't necessarily define, and we're not going to ask them to plant 800 feet worth of trees there. Um, that's not reasonable. Also, if it's left open-ended, a neighbor could potentially force them to cover, for example, all 800 feet of a property. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, I would think that just containing the amplified music would be more than enough at this point. I think the point has been made to the applicant that this is an issue and they may use that at their own discretion to handle this on their own. Again, stating repeatedly that they want to be good neighbors and they're going to comply with a good neighbor ordinance. So we, just, we can just leave it at that then. Okay. So, no. No. So, no. Right. so the only condition we have so far is that they just have to keep the music inside after six to the structure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Do we have a second on that? Second. Nothing. All in favor? Okay, so that passes with the restriction of the amplified music being inside at 6 p.m. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Two hours later. <laughs> <laughs> we knew that would be the hard one. <laughs> Appeal number 2662, which is a variance appeal by the design company on behalf of Champion Realty Trust, which is Dan Fitzgerald, it's 6 Champion Street, Accessors Map, U1, Lot 87. I'm going to ask Mr. Longstaff to give us a little background on this application, please. Uh, yes, this, this is uh, a variance appeal being that the property is both within the shoreline zone and the uh, floodplain. It's not eligible for um, any other type of variance. Um, basically, very similar to a, uh, uh, an appeal that was heard, uh, I think, in 2017. Uh, the cottage, uh, the proposal is to remove and replace the existing cottage with another dwelling. Um, our ordinance and our shoreland zoning ordinance, Chapter 405C, um, says um, if a non-conforming building or structure is demolished or removed by or for its owner, it shall not be re rebuilt or replaced except in conformity with the requirements of Section 15B of this ordinance. 15B requires that all dwellings or structures be located more than 75 feet from the highest annual tide line. Um, this whole property is pretty much within that 75-foot buffer, as are several other properties down at Higgins Beach. Uh, so it's not an uncommon issue or problem um, to, or challenge, if you will, to have. Um, and so uh, Mr. Wilson's going to explain to you um, his reasoning as to why he believes that this um, is going to qualify for that area. Okay. Okay, Walter Wilson from the design company. Uh, there's a couple things I've got to talk to you about tonight, but the first thing I want to do is read what I gave the board as to what we want to do. Um, I'm representing Dan Fitzgerald and Champion Realty Trust in the application of the Board of Appeals for a variance to demolish and replace an existing residential building at 6 Champion Street pursuant to the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. Properties identified in the Scarborough taps ma tax maps as lot U01-87, located in the CDCR1 Higgins Beach character zone. According to the Scarborough tax assessor's records, the existing residence was constructed in 1966. The property has access to Champion Street over an easement across the, the abutus property and has beach frontage on the Atlantic Ocean. There is no immediate street frontage on the lot. A concrete seawall bisects the property resulting in a usable lot size of 50 foot by 73 feet containing basically 3,600 square feet. Um, the site is also affected by several overlay districts from the town of Scarborough and other government agencies. These districts include the Scarborough Zoning District, the Scarborough Shoreline Zoning Ordinance, FEMA Flood Zone, Frontal Dune Regulations, Erosion Hazard Area Regulations, Department of Environmental Protection Regulations, and like Brian has indicated, the highest annual tide hat line uh, were within the 75-foot setback. The Shoreland Zoning Ordinance allows for the replacement of an existing structure if, it, if the proposal conforms to Section 15B or a variance is given by the Zoning Board of Appeals. The ordinance also permits the structure to be increased in size up to 30% in square footage and volume and to be relocated to conform to the setback requirements to the greatest extent uh, practical. The proposed building size and location actually satisfies these requirements. The existing building has a concrete block foundation on a crawl space. The <coughs> Shirley and Zoning Ordinance requires the lowest floor level to be elevated at least one foot above the 100-year floodplain. The DEP allows for the replacement of buildings under Chapter 355, Section 6D, and also under Section 6G. And they state, all buildings modified or reconstructed must have the lowest portion of the structural members of the lowest floor constructed on a post and piling foundation. 
and to be elevated at least three feet above the highest natural elevation around the foundation. So they are more restrictive than the town and the existing foundation is non-compliance with those requirements. The, natural high, the highest natural elevation around the property is set at 11 foot 4 inches. The existing building is at 12 foot 9. Using the uh, uh, DEP rule, the first floor elevation must be at least 16 foot 4 to, to satisfy those rules. The existing flood zone is A2 elevation 11 and it's being proposed that it will eventually change to a VE elevation 15. And it's advisable to establish a finished floor elevation on the replacement building that would satisfy the proposed new flood zone. The results on this require a finished floor elevation of 18 feet. In other words, at least seven feet higher than the existing ground. Um, we're proposing 18 foot 11 inches. The proposed re uh, replacement building design has received approval from the CDCR1 character base zoning district requirements. And that was approved uh, as being substantially compliant to those regulations in March of this year. The existing building is 28 foot by 36 foot 4. The proposed building be 28 foot by 34 foot. The ocean front wall of the proposed building will be located six feet further inland than the existing building. We, we have an increase in square footage, but we do not exceed the 30% allow allowable. We have an increase in the volume, and we do not exceed the 30% allowable on that. Now, we have an existing building there. And if we were to use, utilize the existing building on the concrete block foundation and install a second floor above the existing building through a vertical expansion, it's very problematic. The Sherland Zoning Ordinance um, does allow that with limitations. The DEP requirements are more restrictive. On the coastal sand dune rules, I mean, this is in a frontal sand dune, it says a new structure or addition to an existing structure may not be constructed on a seawood sea of the frontal dune. And then they list an exception under 6B4. And it says that all buildings modified, or, uh, which allows for a vertical expansion, but all buildings modified or reconstructed pursuant to 6B must have the lowest floor constructed on a post and piling foundation. So that means an existing building, if you want to expand it vertically, the building has to have a different foundation under it. In order to install a wood piling support system, the existing building would need to be removed so that the piles could be put in place. Because the lot size and the lack of space between the property and adjacent building buildings, the existing building cannot be moved off site. Now, the Scarborough Shoreland Zoning Ordinance and the DEP allow for replacement and expansion of a building that meets the standards and requirements of their respected ordinances. An application for the proposed replacement building has been uh, filed with the DEP and a decision is pending. We have not yet received that yet because it takes several months and we've been in there since, I think, three months ago. In, irregardless of that, if we're going to proceed with the project, the variance is required from the Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeals to demolish the building and replace it with a proposed building as, sh as shown on the attached plans. Uh, the proposed building is good, like I said, it's going to be set back six feet further than the existing. It's going to be two foot four inches shorter in depth, and the new placement will make it meet the side yard setbacks, the front setback, and the only big problem we have is within the 875 foot hat setback line. And that's the reason we're in for the variance because we're in not compliance with 15B, which states you have to be further than 75 feet. So that's what we're in for, uh, for the appeal. Now, the plans I supplied to both Brian, the town, and you people show 
proposed elevations of the pilings, finished first floor elevation, and so forth. Now we come up in the process of applying with DEP with a conflicting problem. The existing, I don't want to get all tied up in the weeds here because it gets very, very complicated, believe me. The existing classification of the lot is an AE, um, let's get the right number, AE 11. And what that means is that the floodplain is at elevation 11. Okay. Excuse me, uh, Madam Chair. Excuse me, Walt. It's actually an AO depth one foot. Yes, I'm getting to this. Okay. <laughs> okay. And that has been, for 30 years, the standard for this area. Um, the proposal from FEMA and the maps that they came out with, which has been subject to a lot of postponement, in the maps it has this new lot being elevated to a VE elevation 15. Now, another map has come out that delineates this different from what the FEMA proposal is, and it's just recently come out, which is going to make it into a VE 17. And instead of being in an AE 11, it's going to go in an AO three. So we have conflicting floodplain levels that we're dealing with and we've been trying to get it straightened out for the last two weeks for DEP. But they've been on vacation, booked up on meetings and they know what we're trying to ask for and as of yet they have not clarified what is the actual elevation requirements that we need. So um, Northeast Civil Solutions has been talking with DEP primarily through uh, emails and so forth. And they're in hopes to get some type of answer and a clarification on this sometime next week. Now, what's that mean to you people? Almost nothing, really. <laughs> <That's kind laughs> because what I was you're, thinking, dealing, you're dealing with the location <laughs> of the building, okay, and the right to tear down and rebuild. But all the limitations that go on to that with the elevations and stuff on the plans that I've got and according to the character ordinance that we get approved for are affected if we don't get the right elevation because we have to change that. And what that in, indirectly does, if I have to raise it up another foot, I've got a 35 foot height limitation from DEP and we're at 34 foot 9 inches now so I may have to change the design of the building a little bit. So, what that gets down to is whatever I have presented you back when I applied has slightly changed or been confused by this new problem that's arose and I want to make sure it gets right so if we get approval to do this, I don't want to come back and say we've got to modify it because we've got different things we have to deal with. So, with that said, I'm asking the table this for another month. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Until I can get the right answer. That was a roundabout way to go about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was about to ask you, are you actually prepared to do this then? Yeah. Okay. Do, so that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Well, I, I have a, another question that's concerning the uh, V zone that uh, I read about here. Well, we're not going to, he's so, asking to table it. But right? that's, is that pending? I'm sorry, what the, was that? The V, the reclassification of this as a V zone? Is oh, that yes. something that's, that's been pending for a couple, three years. Okay, I, that, I realize that. <clears throat> so it, it, the likelihood of that changing in the next month is, is not very high. That's well, here's where we're in a problem with. Yeah, okay. I know. <laughs> the FEMA maps that they put out right. show it going to a VE-15, VE, yeah. and that's been proposed pro not to go into effect probably till next spring. Okay. After being postponed for a year. So you're not jeopardizing. But then I got other maps that have come out <laughs> saying it's, it's VE 17. So, so we're in a quandary as to which one applies. Let's let's do the vote on the tabling, and Walt and I can discuss how yeah. we because I also have many questions, and I'll inform the board. Okay, and sounds great. That sounds perfect. Okay. I know you sent the application up for the DEP to review <clears> under the ordinance. Did you heard anything back from that? Yeah. 
It seems to me that no one's hearing anything back from DEP on these questions right now because I don't think they're settled on what it is and they're all confused. That's usually what happens. Okay, do we have a... So motion to uh, table appeal number 2662. Second. All in favor? I thank you. Sorry, you had thank to you. sit for two hours. I know. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> such an email. Oh my you, you, you could have called me, Walt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What kind of fun would that be? Well then, so five minutes later, we're on to appeal number three. Oh. Appeal number 2663, which is a practical difficulty variance appeal by Kevin and Margaret Buckley at One Crossing Drive, which is assessor's map U33, lot 84. And I will ask. Mr. Longstaff here to give us a quick introduction. If you could give me just a moment. Yep, absolutely. That one moves so fast I can't catch up. <laughs> and you guys were tucked in and ready for another two hour boat, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we'll be here all night. That's right. <laughs> Not true. Not true at all. So, this proposal, uh, this app applicant rather, is, is in front of you for a practical difficulty variance. Um, it's all due to the fact that uh, the appellant would like to install what I believe, I'm not a pool expert, but I believe to be an average size pool. I don't believe it's a super large pool. I don't believe it's a super small pool. Uh, but it's an average size pool, and as he got laying out the location with his pool installer, he came and talked to me because they realized that because of the angle of the house and the fact that the, the lot is on a corner and therefore has two 40-foot frontages, one from Crossing Drive and one from uh, Orchard Street, that in order to locate it where it would most easily go and where they desire to have it, it's angled so that this upper portion is going to encroach into the 40-foot setback by a little bit. That's basically because of the skirting, the concrete skirting mm -hmm. that they put around the pools to support them. And so, we did, he had applied for a pool permit. Bless you. Excuse me. Um, he had applied for the pool permit. We denied the pool permit. I believe you have a copy of that denial. <coughs> in your packet and his uh, request of me is what can I do, what's the next step, what's my, what are my options and of course everyone has the ability or the right to um, file an appeal. Um, I, you know, and I of course explained to the appellant that you know, here's the criteria that you need to meet and so here we are, here he is, here they are. They're going to try to demonstrate why they feel they, they meet that uh, criteria. Hi. Good evening. Hello. So I'm Kevin Buckley, One Crossing Drive in Scarborough. And this is Peggy. Peggy. Thank you. Would you like to elaborate on anything here? Mr. Uh, I think the plans kind of spell out what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, it's a 16 by 32 foot pool. Um, the, the footprint that we have right now as far as where the house sits and the setbacks on both um, Orchard Street and Crossing Drive uh, fall into a, an area where uh, we can't move anything closer to the house at all because of A, when they're trying to uh, dig the pool, they, have, they need four feet around that whole setback and everything else like that. So when we found the markers, the actual survey markers that are in the land, we still have the granite. Uh, stones in the corner, so we're able to identify those, do the measurements out and things to that nature to identify where exactly we are against uh, where the property lines are from the property lines to the house. We double check that in all the other components of the land. Um, so the pictures that I'm showing up here are basically showing you from our property line um, to the 40-foot section, actually where the corner of the, um, the north part of the 
uh, pool is going to land. It's going to land right on that 40 foot mark. So this is where the actual pool pool is going to be sitting. So it doesn't allow us for that four foot concrete patio on that particular set section of it. And that's the shortest, most tight area that we have as far as that's concerned. Uh, we can't come any close to the house because that just puts the the pool too close to the house. And uh, for safety purposes, I wouldn't want any closer than that with people going around the pool either. So those are the concerns we have there. On the, um, on the other point of the pool on the Orchard Street, Street side, there's a, um, we're currently at 43 feet to that pool corner, but again, you give that allotment of the four foot um, concrete patio around that, it falls short of one foot on the setback, so it brings it to 39 feet. So what we're doing is we're asking for the, a six foot setback um, on that particular um, Orchard Street side to bring it to 34 feet setback versus the 40 to accommodate that. All the other setbacks as far as the other from, from uh, crossing drive or from the, the, um, the neighbor's property line to ours accommodate all the other setbacks as far as what we're trying right. to do. So we'll now go to, through the criteria, and I'll just ask the questions, and you can just read the answers in, and I'll elaborate if you'd like. So number one, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property, and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. So the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstance in the layout of Block 51 with its 40-foot setbacks on both the north side, Orchard Street property line, and the northeast side, Crossing Drive, leaving the in-ground pool dimensions with concrete patio required for pool surround short on the north corner by four feet. The other end of the pool on the northeast corner, Orchard Street, is one foot short of property line setback. The shallow end of pool that abuts Lot 52, 15-foot setback, conforms to town code requirements. Number two, the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of the abutting properties. The granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have any detrimental consequences to abutting properties. The requested variance area is a level area of yard space and will not impede on abutting property in any way. Number three, the practical difficulty is not a result of the action taken by the applicant or prior owner. No. Four, no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. With setbacks conforming to two of the three property lines and location of pool next to the dwelling on the northeast side, the pool cannot be placed closer to the existing house for safety purposes of patio being too close to the house. Again, for safety purposes, pool stairs as outlined in the plan cannot be located closer to the house. The professional pool installation company, Pool Shed, requires the four foot concrete patio perimeter for structural integrity of the in-ground pool. The pool installation will require four feet, four foot excavated area beyond the dimensions of the in-ground pool. Therefore, there is no feasible alternative for placement of pool location. Did you guys explore a smaller pool? We did. And what was unfeasible about that? swimming capability. I mean, you can get a smaller pool, and I know that pools are nice for just lounging in, and I want to lounge in it too, but I also want to be able to swim. Mm -hmm. I like to do, you know, more than two strokes and be at the other end, so it's it's kind of a going yeah. into retirement thing and thinking of, like, what can we do with a pool other yeah. than just have a party. I'd just like to ask a follow-up question. I've owned two pools, one in ground and one above, and so I'm real familiar with pools. Okay. Um, Okay, so the, the width is 16 feet, <coughs> the pool itself. Correct. All right, in order to comply, it would have to be, if I'm not mistaken, it would have to be 12 feet wide. But it could still be 32 feet long, is that correct? If I'm understanding no, I, this. The, the pool, if we were to get the 12 foot, yeah. it's only 24 foot, uh, 24 feet in length. Not, but not couldn't they build a 32 34. feet long? It would be like a lap pool. Mm -hmm. If you want to swim, I mean, that would certainly be. But you're, well, you swim want to and have fun. I mean, it would be nice to fit your family yeah. in there and not just two, three people. 
question. Can I ask a question now or should I wait? Um, is, have you explored the possibility of putting the pool on the other side of the property adjacent to the driveway? Unfortunately, this, this, property, this property diagram um, is the original footprint of the original house. On the other side of the property, there is a breezeway and garage uh, now. Uh, I don't have uh, that plan when I came here. Gotcha. That plan that was the gotcha. that was so what I was it. given. I, I think there is. A, I, I know there is. We. I think Brian. When we actually sat down. There was another plan in the folder that outlined the both breezeway and garage. So we're gotcha. on that 15 foot setback already on that side. Yep. No understood. Is there? <laughs> um, are you in public water, public sewer? Yes. Okay. So there's no leach field or anything like that out there. Okay. May I ask a general question? Please. Going, our general question. Uh, previously, I stated that the requirements of the pool with existing property lines, only four feet to be desired. But yes. I recall uh, the request for variance is six feet. I just didn't want to be that close. I wanted to give myself a little bit of room here. Just so you don't go over here. I know that I'm put it happens. on there, but I don't want somebody coming up and saying I'm three inches short. Okay. Thank you. I'm just trying to make sure that I've got that capability. Five, the granting of a variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. The variance will result in containing the applicant's property into conformance with other surrounding properties. I have a question here. Uh, when you're talking about property here, you're talking about the pool itself, not your home. Okay, it's because this is, we're really considering um, an additional uh, building, okay? It's because this is considered a mm -hmm. building. Okay. Right. And so, you know, to me, this is the question here. Really, is you know, does does this mean your house would be your the pool? Okay, a house with a pool. Okay, yeah. that feature. Okay, would be more in conformance with okay. the homes in your neighborhood in general. Now, if I, if I'm misreading that, Brian, tell me. But that's just the way I see this. It's just what you're asking for. You know, the property that or the building. Okay? Yeah. Because technically, it's a structure. All right. Correct. You know, is, is, am I reading it right, Brian, or is that uh, reading too much into it? You know, in all honesty, that's that's an interpretation that is up to the board because it, it <laughs> I, I can't answer that question. Yeah. It isn't it isn't saying it's more it's in more conformity with the ordinance requirements for sure. Yeah, right. Um, so I think it, it's sort of case specific, and quite honestly, I don't really see that it's all that applicable to this particular case. Yeah. Where I, I'll, I'll illustrate an example of why I say that. If you lived in a neighborhood where everyone had a two car garage but you, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you needed a variance in order to have a two car garage like right. everybody else in the neighborhood, right. exactly. that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's why I asked the question because but not everybody, everybody has a neighborhood. Or <laughs> not even everybody, but let's say the there. majority of homes in your neighborhood have mm -hmm. pools. Yep. That, that, that would be a compelling argument to me. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's the case in Maine. Yeah. Well, I mean, we do have pools in the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah the but it's, it's really the exception more than yeah. the, oh, the norm. For sure. Yeah. yeah, true. So, and that's just, I'm just simply bringing this up because I think it's, you know, it's something that, it's in the back of my mind, you mm -hmm. know, is, is a pool really something that's typical in the neighborhood? And, and in effect, does this, this make it more conforming to what the neighborhood has in general? This is, this is good for our discussion. Yeah. Well, it's, it's good. I mean, there are actually three pools in our neighborhood, one across the street, um, one two doors down. Okay. And if you go down Orchard Street, another two doors down, there was a brand new one that okay. was put in. So there are some. There yeah. are more there are coming. Some. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this is the trend. People want pools. Yeah. Okay. The second, right. second follow-up question to be with, with sure. that would be, what are the size of the other pools in the neighborhood? Comparable. So we have um, one neighbor down the street that has whatever the next size pool up is from a 1632. All right, so this is a rectangular that. pool and it's 560 square feet. So, you know, they're all shapes of pools. You know, my ground pool that I had was a free form. Mm -hmm. You know, I basically, you know, laid some stuff out in the ground, said, here, build it like that. Yeah. And it was poured concrete, same mm -hmm. thing. So, yeah, there are all different ways you can measure a pool. But, you know, I look at it in terms of square footage as opposed to width mm -hmm. and length. Or if it's circular, I mean. From right. what I've seen with my own eyes, yeah. and I don't know the measurements of any of them, they are all rectangular and they are all comparable either to ours or maybe the next size up. Right. 
And they're all okay. on the ground like oh, this. Brian's, yeah. Brian's pulling yeah. up the aerials there for us. Yes. That one, I believe, is, a, is a, an 18 by 36. Two doors down from us, they used to have an, an above ground, and they just did an in-ground. And then the Farino family that's down on the same street as us has had theirs for probably eight years, and it's a rectangular, very similar to what we want. Across the street was the owner of Powell Inn, and they have um, a rectangular pool, too. And then two doors down-ish on Orchard Street, There's one down they one. have... Yeah. Above that's yeah, their three. second pool. The first one did not make it. So it looks, looks like we've got some above grounds. I and see some wedding grounds. No, There's some above, above grounds. I'm not sure how new this picture is, but I know one of them. A lot of circular above grounds there. Yeah. yeah I'm seeing a lot of small pools. Mm -hmm. Did you explore above ground pools? pools? What's that? An above ground pool? Did we explore it? Yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah. Just kind of had our heads set on that one. That's all. <laughs> okay. Well, Six. The granting and, of a and I understand that. I've, I've sunk a lot of money into an egg round, I know. And uh, <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> I can also tell you the horror stories about what happens when you go to try right. to sell your house, but I'm not going to say that. <laughs> oh, that's all right. All right. Number six the granting of a variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. Granting of a variance will have no unreasonable adverse effect on the natural environment. Seven, the property is not located in whole or in part within the shoreland area as defined in 38 on MRSA, section 435, or in the flood hazard zone as defined in the Town of Scarborough floodplain management ordinance. Correct. This property is not loca located in whole or in part within the shoreland area as defined in 38 MRSA 435, or flood hazard zone as defined in the Town of Scarborough floodplain management ordinance. And I'm sure there were, there were other criteria in this section that we need to look at in terms of, of um, I have to look it up. Let me go to my... Okay. Deals? No, it's not that one. It's just one. No, yes, under the practical difficulty variance, we just went through the seven qualifications. We did, uh, yeah, that was A. Question. But it's also B. Correct. Yeah, we have the seven questions, but then we have B. Correct. Yeah. So we really need to discuss that one, too. Um, do we have any other questions before we open it to the public? Uh, I have a question if you, sorry. No. The, um, my thought is, uh, so there are no other, and I understand like standard size is 14 by 32, and then there's like a 10 by 20 um, standard size to go with a custom length pool that they can pour. Was that not an option or? We're just looking for the standard way to get the most out of our, as far as the width that we, you know, we don't, we right. don't want a, a swim channel to go back. And no, especially no. If had, especially if we had, Kids that are growing up, my grandchildren now are going to start using a pool now. And what I don't want is to have a pool so narrow that somebody decides they want to jump off the side there and hit the head on the other side because they're sure. they're playing around. So sure. um, it's also a safety concern as far as us, along with the convenience. We we would like that. We, you know, we didn't want to obviously didn't have room for the larger pool. If we did, we would have thought about that. But I think the twenty, the twelve by twenty four is just a, a, a it's just going to dwarf what we're trying to accomplish there. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the reasonableness of asking for an additional six feet on there, um, you know, I think is, is something that we've been, we feel comfortable with it without saying, well, I need 20 feet, I need 10 feet. I'm just looking for six to cover that, that skirt. Okay. Thank you. I think what we're just asking, though, too, is it, did you explore putting in a custom poo, pool that would have the dimensions that would just allow for that? that uh, section of the, the lot where it would encroach. We didn't look for customization at all. We were looking for the standardized pools and we felt that that one kind of did what we were looking for. So we did not explore and, that. And Eric at the pool shed also spoke to us in, in some depth about the fact that you get into higher costs. And we're not looking for, I don't know, I'm just learning these pool things. You're the pool man, but got night and really. all these fancy <laughs> things. I'm watching all those pool shows on TV and I'm like, oh, it'd be nice to have that, but we're not going there. We're just going with a standard. We've always wanted a pool. We couldn't give it to our kids when they were growing up. We want to give it to the grandchildren. It's just like a 
last hurrah thing we want to accomplish in our lifetime. It's on my bucket list. It's on my bucket list. And it's, you know, it's a swimmable pool, not so, just a... So, a couple more questions about the, the pool configuration. Will you have a dive, diving board at one end? No diving no, board. No, no diving, board. diving board. Okay. Slide. And where will stairs be located? On the side or on... The yeah, so I, did, I didn't put the stairs in, but if you look at the back of the... the um, so on the back side of the property, so if you're facing Crossing Drive and looking yeah. forward, the house sits there. That little section onto the onto the side is where the eight foot section is going to be. Okay, so it's on a corner. Okay. It won't be in the corner. Oh, oh. Okay. oh on the it'll, side. It'll, so it, it's yeah. so I dripping yeah. down. So it'll, it, it'll be an eight foot. Will it be a, just one uniform depth, or will it taper down? The pool itself. Yeah. The yes. Depth the, the, there will be a deep end to it. Yes. <coughs> okay. Thank I'm you. I'm going to open much. it up to the public. If there's anyone who would, yes, we go back to Jack now. If there's anyone who would like to speak, the um, invisible man in the back. Did we receive, <laughs> <laughs> did we receive any letters or emails? Madam Chair, we did not receive any letters, any written communication, any emails or phone calls on this. Okay. Thank you. So now we're going to go through the qualifications and discuss them. Um, just want to remind the board the def definitions that come in here um, under a practical difficulty variance. Practical difficulty is defined as a case where the strict application of the dimensional standards. Did I close the public hearing? I thought you did. Did I? You close it again. Close it again. again. <laughs> I don't know if I did. Sorry. <laughs> I heard it close that time. Now, now it's closed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's <laughs> Um, practical difficulty is defined as a case where the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which a variance is sought would both preclude the use of the property which is permitted in the zone in which it is located and also would result in a significant economic injury to the applicant. So it says it would also result. So we have to review this application with the idea that they are going to be incurring a significant economic injury by not being able to put their pool in. So let's go through the criteria. Number one, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. The applicant has done a very good job at providing drawings and information showing that they are on a, they are on a corner, so they have setbacks on two different sides that they're trying to deal with. And um, Ms. Torrance. Yeah, I believe that, that, that number one is met. I agree, number one, um, certainly met with what has been shared and provided to us. Uh, they've, dem <coughs> they've demonstrated on the drawing of the part plan uh, the dimensions that the pool physically can't, in its current form, can't go anywhere else on the property. Uh, that includes the opposite end of the property where they have currently a breezeway garage already in place. So this is the only spot that could potentially uh, house this size of pool. Uh, to me, the, uh, the key issue is uh, really the fact that you have two 40-foot setbacks, not one. Because if they didn't have, uh, if they only had one 40-foot setback in the front yard, this would not be an issue, probably. You know, as long as the building where the main house is located where it is. So that is a unique situation. Now, there are other corner lots that, that have to comply with this. But most homes in the neighborhood don't have to, so that makes it unique. So, yeah, it is definitely unique. Mm -hmm. Yes, because other t other neighbors have pools and they do not have to go through this process. Right. So all in favor of one being met. The granting of the variance, number two, the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of the abutting properties. Um, we just discussed this would not be an undesirable change. This is similar to some of the properties of surrounding them as well. Um, the only the only thought I just had is, you know, we haven't talked about it. I mean, I presume that there'll be a fence around this pool. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, so yeah, but then I'm, con I'm comfortable with that one being met. I agree. I feel that this one has been met. No further comment. Uh, I also agree. I don't. I don't have anything to add to this. Other houses have pools. 
Yeah, the fence was my question because it wasn't shown on here. I did, yeah. Yeah, and you know, it would have been nice to have seen exactly where the fence was going to be. I'm not sure what the requirements are for fence setbacks you know, to property lines or uh, especially if you have a 40-foot setback, you know, where, where the fence has to be. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's, I'm sure that would have to comply to whatever the, the code is. We actually have a plan for two fences because we're a little bit paranoid as grandparents. <laughs> That town application actually has on here, fencing or safety barrier must be installed prior to pool use. I have a pool. I am very well aware that you need <laughs> yeah. to have a fence. My yeah, gate is triple locked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you have to have access and egress. <clears throat> that was my experience in South um, Portland. Okay. So I'm not sure what Scarborough requires. Number you have to, people have to be able to get in and out, unfortunately. Yeah. But there are ways of designing latches where you can control yeah. that reasonably. So, yeah, there are solutions to that. Um, okay. Uh, all in favor of two being met? That's five. Um, number three, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Um, this one can be interpreted anyway. The location of their house is not by their action, um, but they are before us tonight because of their action to want a pool. Ms. Torrens. My only struggle with this one is that we brought up the possibility of could you put the, the pool on the other side of the house, and apparently there's now been a garage that's been built there. So that that's the only part of that question that I do struggle with is, um, you know, if they, if the, if the garage was built after the fact, that's a, that's a, an action that was taken that has limited their ability to put in a pool. And I, I that's, we're going to have to decide how we, how we view that. That's a really I'm not sure point. there's adequate room, you know, again, I, I don't mean. No, I, no, I, no, I, I understand yeah, what you're saying too. Sure. Okay, so we're talking about it's not a result of the action taken by the applicant or prior owner, Mr. Perrin. I'm sorry, I have nothing further to add. That's fine. I don't either on this one. I don't know either. <clears throat> okay, all in favor of three being met. Number four, no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. Um, we have discussed at length with the applicant the other alternatives that are available. Um, it's an interpretation, the board's interpretation of feasible. Um, I think any pool is nice. Uh, mm -hmm. Feasible alternative under my eyes is an above ground pool. Um, it's a smaller pool. Um, this is a pretty big pool. Um, they do have, I, I feel they have a feasible yeah. alternative. Ms. Torrance. Um, I think I agree with the chair on that, is that I, I do, I, I struggle with this one as well, as well, because I think there are feasible alterna alternatives available in terms of either custom designed pools, above ground pools, smaller pools. Um, the size of the pool is not necessary for you know, to, to, to not to preclude, you know, the size of the pool does not preclude use or accomplish a significant economic in injury. Um, so I have a hard time justifying that, that one. And I say that with a lot of pain because I can certainly appreciate my, my bucket list of having a pool is the same and I, I, I it, it pains me. But I, I do have a real problem with this one. I don't, I, I, I don't know that we can in, in all reasonableness say that there's no other feasible alternative. Mr. Karen. I regrettably agree um, that as discussed this evening, there may be other 
um, options available, while they may be less desirable. Um, I also concur, and the practical difficulty application is one of the most difficult ones to pass through. Um, the, the argument for no other feasible alternative is probably one of the hardest ones to try to justify in front, uh, front of a board like ours. Um, there is a feasible alternative, and of course it's not the dimension of the size of the pool that you want, but there is a possibility to put a pool there. Um, and that is, it, it's an unfortunate circumstance just due to the nature of the corner lot that you're on because you have 40 foot setbacks on each side because there are two, this crossing drive and Orchard Street there. Um, and the 40 foot setbacks there were put in for a purpose. Um, you know, it, just thinking about it, worst case scenarios of something coming off of the road that's out of control or something like that. But the 40 foot setback rule, the 40 foot setback is there for a reason. Uh, and one of the one of the purposes of the zoning board of appeals is to is to limit and eliminate nonconformities as much as possible where we can feasibly. Um, so um, unfortunately, with this one, I can't agree with this particular point, though, uh, and, and, I, and I empathize. Um, but this one, I can't I can't agree with. All right. So what this comes down to for me is just uh, reasonable alternatives. And, um, and that really comes to want versus need, and um, what's practical versus you know what you know would be very desirable. Um, and, and again, we, we really need to look at this you know strictly according to the rules and mm -hmm. not grant variances unless there's a significant difficulty here. I I just don't see where it's a hardship uh, for us to limit the dimensions of this to. The, you know, the 40 foot setback requirements. You know, if you wanted to have a rectangular pool, you know, that would allow you to uh, put in one that's still 32 feet long, but the width would be reduced to 12 feet. Um, that's, that's a good sized pool still. And is it as wide as what you would like to have? No, okay, but you know, 12 feet is still a reasonable width. And so to me, that's a reasonable alternative, not what you want here, but uh, it's something that's very doable within you know the current standards. Okay. All in favor of four being met. And not against yeah. That's five. No. Number five, the granting of a variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. I think my kind of interpretation of this is there are other properties around who have pools that did not need this um, variance, and so it would not bring it into conformance with the surrounding properties by granting this. Yeah, I, I don't think you can make a reasonable argument that, um, that this brings it into more of a conforming, uh, you know, conforming with the neighborhood. I mean, there's several houses in the neighborhood without pools. There are houses with above ground pools of different shapes, different sizes. I, I can't I can't justify this one. Um my impression or opinion on this one is leaning towards Trent as was shared. Um, other properties within the vicinity that may not need to apply for such a variance or go through this process are able to get pools. There's been an increase. Um, while at this time it may not bring it into conformity with the current number of pools, it's not to say that sometime in the future um, it could possibly do so. I don't see an issue. Um, Necessarily with this one, other folks are having pools in the area. It, it, I would say it is more of a trend than not that people want to have these in their yard. Um, but again, the, the hiccup for me is just uh, the feasible alternative for number four. But I don't see any issues with number five. Uh, I think, in a way, we're splitting hairs on this one. And uh, yeah, pools are a minority in, in this neighborhood, uh, but it's the trend. So, I mean, how. To me, this is not an issue at all. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, 
It doesn't matter. I could go either way on this one, quite honestly. Okay, all in favor of five being met. Number six, the granting of a variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. Uh, the applicant has said that there will be no unreasonable adverse effect on the natural environment. And I'm sure the design they have and everything would make the environment good, nice, and designed pretty. I think, you know, my, my thinking on whether they've answered this adequately or not is, is kind of irrelevant because of the fact that I, the feasible alternative issue is such a big one. But um, you really didn't respond to this question. You just reiterated it. And, uh, you know, you, I, I do have to wonder when you, when you dig a big giant hole in the back of your yard, you know, it changes, it changes the way water seeps into the ground. It changes a lot of the runoff around your house. Um, and so I, it, you know, I would have liked to have seen more information about what was explored and what was talked about on that on that question. Um, without more information, I can't say either way whether there's an, any adverse effect or not because there's really no information there. I don't have much to add to that. Um, thinking of a pool, comfortable in the summertime. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about it. Um, I don't. I don't see an issue with this one. Uh, I mean, pool's been installed and put in place for years without really any adverse effect on the environment. Um, I don't have an issue with this. Uh, I certainly agree with that. If pools were properly installed, which this one most certainly would be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is a, a significant investment. It's going to be done the right way, and it will not harm the environment in any way. Mm -hmm. okay. All in favor of six being met. Number seven, the property is not located in whole or in part within a shoreline area as defined in the ADA MRSA 435 or hazard, flood hazard zone as defined in the Thomas Scarborough floodplain managed ordinance. I can verify that. The town is the long stop is verified that they are not in the shoreland zone or in the flood hazard zone. I'm comfortable the standards in that. Yep. No further comment. Um, no further comment. No comment. Okay, all in favor of seven. I'll move to approve appeal number 2663 as presented. Second. We need a second. We have to second. No, we don't second. need a second. Well, second. Yeah. <laughs> we do. Then we <laughs> deny. You don't have a vote. Yeah. Right, right, okay. correct. So all in favor? And those against? Sorry. No, not this size. Not, not this pool. Not this pool. Okay. Right. Just I think the, the, the honest answer is you need to explore some other options. Yeah. yeah. If, if you'd already had done that and came in with how it was going to pose significant economic injury to go with a customized pool that would meet the dimensions, the board could have seen that. So right. you, you, you clearly stated that you haven't looked in those directions. You were going with a stock size. I think you need to look at some other options and see what you can and then yeah. come back. No. no, if you can look at options if you look at options require a, sub uh, a variance, excuse me, then you just can apply for your pool permit again and not come back here. Sounds right. That's, that's what we need to look at. Yeah. What we're saying is it has to be within the setbacks. Okay, so okay. we look at that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. whatever is it with the setbacks, then you go see Brian. Okay. And, you know, whatever staff has to review it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any other comments generally? There's nothing on the agenda. So I'll move to adjourn unless Mr. Longstaff has any comments you'd like. Uh other than we do have an applicant for the final uh 
alternate spot, uh, an applicant which I expect will be um, appointed by council prior to our next meeting. I think. Awesome. I'm not 100% sure. That's, nice. That's that great. Would, that would be good. Good to know. So should we keep the uh, Walter Wilson uh, presentation? Yeah. Uh, would, you, would you all make sure you turn in your oh, binders? Yes. The whole thing will, will she'll go through it. She'll make sure that Wilson, correct. And put all everything all back in your yep. binders Good. and leave them with us. Don't take them home. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. And we'll make sure that Don't take Walt's them home, Melinda. <laughs> <back. laughs> I'll move to adjourn. I'll second. Second. All favor. Give me to it. Oh, great.